meeting to order for the afternoon of November 10th, 2020. Uh, Tony? Jimenez? Present. Carlos? Here. Yep. Carrasco? Here. Davis? Here. Esparza? Here. Arenas? Here. Foley? Here. Camus? Camus? Here, sorry. Thank you. Jones? Present. Licardo? Present. Thank, Thank you, you, Tony. Diep also present. Thank and you. Councilor Diep as well. Wonderful. Uh, thank you all. Uh, if you are able, please join us in standing for the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance. Flag. 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 The United States of America. And to the Republic. Republic for which it stands. Stand. One nation. One nation. Under God. Under God. Indivisible. 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 Liberty. 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 Justice. 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 Thank you. Today's invocation will be provided by the United Veterans of Santa Clara County, presenting Virtual Veterans Day 2020. Councilman Camus will tell us more. Thank you, Mayor, and um, uh, and, and thank you for appointing me to, as a liaison uh, to the veterans of our city. It, it's been an honor and a privilege to serve, and um, it's been a very rewarding experience over the last four years. Uh, the board of directors of the UVC and their members uh, work tirelessly to, to assist their fellow veterans and to improve their quality of life. I will uh, forever appreciate the dedication these veterans have to our country and to all of us living here in the Bay Area. Uh, and today, our invocation will be conducted by Pastor Bill McConnell. Um, and Bill has lived in San Jose. Uh, the San Jose area since 1969. He's a retired minister who currently serves as the veteran a community, uh, as, a, as their chaplain for the United Veterans Council, the Veterans Supportive Services Agency, the American Legion Post 858, and the, v the Vietnam Veterans of America. He doesn't sound retired to me. Uh, but uh, Bill is, the, is a U.S. Navy uh, Vietnam veteran serve, serving from 1968 to 1974 with uh, duty throughout the Pacific. And uh, following the invocation will be a, a special announcement video from the United Veterans Council inviting you to attend their virtual Veterans Day parade, which is tomorrow. You know, we've, we've held this parade uh, for a uh, hundred years in San Jose. And this is the first year that we've actually had to go, uh, that they've had to go virtual. Um, and I've, I've been honored to be in, in, that, um, in that parade every year uh, in, my, in, in office uh, and uh, just, just to, to thank the veterans for all they've done for our country. I don't know if the pastor is ready to go. Is, is he online? There he is. Good afternoon. Thank you, Mayor and Johnny Camus and other council members for allowing me to join you today and via this, this video uh, to be able to bring the invocation. I'm extremely honored on behalf of the United Veterans Council of Santa Clara County. I, I wanna thank you for allowing me to come and to bring this prayer on this uh, day before Veterans Day. And we're all excited about the Veterans Day and, and the uh, parade that we've been able to, uh, to film and uh, we thank you for your support to this parade. Uh, without you, believe me, this none of this would happen, but we thank you and we thank the city council and all the support we receive from our government officials. And now I would like to bring this morning's invocation. So if we could all just bow our heads uh, and we'll go before, before the Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you today for your amazing love for us. We want to thank you, Lord, for our nation, the United States of America, a nation that you brought forth and have sustained through many wars, conflicts, and pestilences. We want to thank you for our freedom and for the liberty we enjoy every day. We want to thank you for this wonderful city of San Jose that we live in and for all those who serve faithfully to govern our city and to keep it safe. I pray, Lord, for each one gathered here in these chambers to conduct the serious business before them. Lord, you know we live in trying times, 
and you know they need your wisdom to navigate the issues that face them. Please grant them the wisdom, strength, and courage they need each and every day. Lord, tomorrow is a special day. It's unlike any other day of the year in our country. Tomorrow is Veterans Day, the day set aside by our country to honor and give thanks to our veterans for their service and their sacrifice. For it is these men and women who answered the call of our nation, who paid the price, who bore the burden, who met the hardships and assured the survival and the success of liberty for all who call America their home. We give thanks to you, Lord, for them. Lord, may you stir our hearts and our minds with the highest sense of gratitude, thankfulness, and patriotism as we remember those who have served, those who have fought, and those who have died for our great nation. Let us be constantly aware every day of their sacrifice. May we always be ready to reach out and say thank you for their service and their sacrifice. May all that Veterans Day symbolizes renew our faith in freedom, our devotion to democracy, and redouble our efforts to assure the survival and the success of liberty. Grant that we may dedicate ourselves afresh and anew to the task of daily embracing the goodwill and freedom that our forefathers and that every American veteran has fought for, suffered for, and have died for. That the pursuit of liberty and justice will live in the hearts of a free people. Let your light always guide us. Let peace and goodwill towards our fellow man be the goal of every American every day. To you, Lord, be the glory and the honor and the power, for it is in your holy name we pray today. Amen. Thank you so much for allowing me to come and share this invocation with you and be a part of this exciting time. Thank you, Pastor, and thank you, Councilmember Kamis. All right, uh, orders of the day. Does anyone on the council May, changes? Mayor, there, there, that, um, oh, that I'm video, sorry. I think, stopped a little early. Oh, it did. Um, I'm sorry, it was cut off. It, it got cut off. In fact, it, it started in the middle and got cut off one like 10 seconds after. I see. But it's, it's a short video. I don't know if it can be queued up. It's, it's okay. having difficulty loading was the, what was the reason for the stopping. So I'm trying to get it going again really quickly here. Okay, we'll give it a quick shot. It looks like I got it. battlefield obviously a white flag indicates surrender but not the case in a memorial it is more about innocence peace virtue that type of thing so that's why we have the white flags veterans day is a way to say thank you i didn't used to pay attention to veterans day ignored it until after my son graduated from high school and joined the Marines. He was part of the initial invasion of Iraq in 2003. I get it. I thank all those who have served our military, who have provided our freedoms, and that allows me to stand right here and speak to you. Thank you very much for your service. Thank you, Councilmember Camus, and thank you, Pastor, and, and to all those who put together that video uh, and the United Veterans Council. We will be distributing by social media their video as well tomorrow uh, of the virtual parade, and we hope everyone can check it out and certainly honor our veterans tomorrow. All right, we'll move now to orders of the day. Does anyone on the council have any changes to the printed agenda?
not, we'll entertain a motion. Move to approve. Second. Second. Right, on the motion. Tony? Yes. Yes. Morales? Aye. Yep. Aye. Osco? Aye. Davis? Aye. Esparza? Yes. Reynas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Camus? Aye. Jones? Aye. Locarno? Aye. <laughs> Thank you. Under the closed session report, Nora? Aye. There was nothing to report out today. Thank you. Thank you. On to the consent calendar. Uh, I have uh, a couple council members would like to pull some items. Council member Foley would like to pull item 2.8, which is the approval of November 1st is the international, and I'm going to mispronounce this, Lennox Guest Out Syndrome Awareness Day, uh, and to recognize November 2020 as Epilepsy Awareness Month. Council member Camus would like to pull item 2.9, which is the proclamation of Small Business Saturday. Are there other items uh, that council would like to pull? All right, um, let's go to the public first and then we'll come back to those specific items. Uh, Tessa Woodman, see, we're on consent. Thank you. Uh, I, I, okay, good, thank you. <coughs> you can hear me. Um, I was disappointed that I didn't get to comment on the, the um, celebratory, whatever that, that thing is that we just had about Veterans Day. But my quick comment about that is that we um, should not be, we, our, our wars are for fossil fuels. And this, this allegiance that's saying that we're fighting for our freedoms is really disingenuous. And then the issue becomes even fascism, where if you say these things, you are, you are, you are then considered a problem. And this you know, is what's happening in our culture, is that we can't even talk about the things that are the problems, the crises, because then we're considered you know, well, by it, 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 our country has become very fascistic in that we can only say certain things, and people are very hostile towards each other, and and this this is a problem. But the issue of celebrating war is really a deep problem that we have in our our culture, and that we really have to reevaluate because our wars are for oil and resources, and this has got to stop. So that was that that whole thing in regards to the celebration of Veterans Day. Um, and in terms of our consent calendar, I guess um, there were issues, I'm sure, that I was going to look at. So let me just go over to my agenda. Um, anyway, I guess I'll just finish with that whole thing about um, the issues, even in our community, that what, where it comes to is what happens is that my council members don't even respond to me. You know, this is what's happening in our in our um, in our our government. They're not even responding to me because maybe they don't like me or something like that. You know, and so this is this has got to stop. We have to have it into this system uh, accountability to respond to our citizenry. It cannot be based on their personal belief systems. Their job is to listen to us, and the whole system is very broken. As I try to contact our uh, council. Thank you. Uh, Blair Beekman, we're on the consent calendar. Yes, hi, good afternoon. I hope I can speak to uh, the uh, Small Business Saturday uh, of item 2.9. I think it should be clear at this point, we need to expand the initial scope of AB 3088. I'm returning to the good work of David Chu and Ash Carver this past summer on housing and small, small business forgiveness ideas and the state funding structures that can very much address debt burden issues. I emphasize all sides are trying to survive this COVID-19 pandemic for the next few years. I think we should uh, work to, on ways to assist, not hinder or place obstacles. I very much question the use of debt burden with what may have been the beginnings of this pandemic. To try to creatively think creatively, I, think, I feel California state funding packages and its growing financial systems can address the fears of recession and foreclosure issues well into 2021 and beyond if needed. Good affordable housing and small business funding ideas can also simply address the new ideas of equity and what can be an overall good course for the next few years. And interesting, interestingly, work toward community healing and solidarity for all sides as well. Uh, thank you uh, for this item. Uh, I wanted to quickly offer with 45 seconds, uh, you, you started a habit on consent calendar that when a person speaks on all the consent calendar items, 
you don't let the person speak again on specific uh, consent calendar items. And I wonder, you know, if I haven't spoken on a specific item that I can allow to be to speak on the item, like uh, I haven't spoken on Pam's fo Pam Foley's issue, can I speak on that if I raise my hand again? You haven't been allowing me to do that as of late. Hopefully you can start doing that again. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speakman. Uh, we're taking these items uh, together on one vote, uh, unless there's, uh, um, see there's another individual, uh, Rufus White. Okay, Mr. White, it appears your microphone is muted right now. Okay, is that better? Yes. Oh. Oh, you're still muted. Testing one, two, three. Yes, we're, we're able to hear you now, sir. Okay. My name is Rufus White and I'm a board member of the East Valley Family YMCA. And I'd like to make a statement on behalf of the, uh, the YMCA and uh, possible funding. The East Valley YMCA, uh, East Valley Family YMCA has for many years uh, been serving this community faithfully. The East Valley YMCA service area has a complex de demographic of socioeconomic mixtures as well as multi-ethnic families. Many have come to depend on the services provided by their neighborhood wide. This includes preschoolers, after school care, elderly care and wellness and socialization. Additionally, the East Valley, East Valley Family YMCA provides services beneficial to many working and retired adults who could otherwise not be able to get them. Not having this facility available to serve the community is a huge loss to the community as evidenced by the outpouring of concern on social media uh, when the closure was announced. Given the high percentage of economically stressed and underserved members dependent on the YMCA for their stability and well being, you are asked, to, uh, at least I am asking you, to grant as much support to keeping the Y in operation as possible. We respectfully submitted Rufus H. White, East Family Family YMCA board member, and Healthy Living Committee chair. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. White. Um, in the future, we, we would typically take that, uh, I believe, under public comment. Uh, this is just on the consent, but I understand you're well underway, so I didn't want to interrupt you. Um, okay, we'll uh, appreciate your comments, and we'll certainly take those into consideration. Uh, we'll come back to the council. Uh, I was going to go to item 2.8, but I see Council Member Rance has raised her hand. Uh, it's on a different item, or? Thank you, uh, Mayor. Yes, I actually was going to. Um, uh, redirect uh, the speaker uh, to 3.3, but uh, oh. now that I that I have the floor, I just want to balance uh, a viewpoint that was expressed uh, during public comment, and that is that we celebrate war. We don't celebrate war. We celebrate our veterans and the and families who have um, lost loved ones and who have had the courage to serve our country this way. Um, you know, I don't know if I myself would be courageous enough to serve in, in the manners that they have. And so I, I want to redirect that comment just to make sure that that's not the last thing that's being said about um, our veterans and, and celebrating Veterans Day. Thank you. Thank you, member. Thank you, Council Member Arenas. I appreciate those comments very much. Okay, let's, um, let's go to item 2.8. Council Member Foley. Thank you, Mayor. From November 1st through November 7th, I was honored to light City Hall in the colors of green and purple in conjunction with International Lennox Gasto Syndrome Awareness Day, that was green, and Epilepsy Awareness Month in purple. Epilepsy impacts nearly 50 million of in individuals worldwide. Lennox Gasto Syndrome is one of the most severe and debilitating forms of epilepsy that first appears in childhood and persists into adult. Individuals living with LGS often suffer from frequent and multiple seizures, daily cognitive impairment, regression, and an increased chance of sudden unexpected death by epilepsy. 
I'd like to thank Tom, Cam, and Carissa from San Jose, from my District 9, for helping bring awareness to this debilitating health challenge. But on a personal note, I'd like to share with you that in 2012, an epileptic seizure nearly took the lives of my daughter and my sister, who has suffer, suffered from epilepsy all her life. May God bless all of those who suffer from ep epilepsy and those around and watch them safely. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember. Any additional comment on 2.8 before we move forward? Councilmember Carrasco. Yes, thank you. Uh, I just wanna thank Councilmember Foley for bringing this to our attention. I don't often talk about this. I have a child who suffers also from epilepsy and she was diagnosed when she was very young. And, uh, and especially, I think it's a, it's a, a condition that n many of us don't know much about. Um, they're starting to understand a bit more about treatment and therapy, but, um, but especially for our Latino families, we're very disconnected from, um, from resources and I surely was one of them, uh, had to uh, seek the, the expertise of many uh, well-known uh, neurologists in the area. But uh, had I not been, uh, you know, had someone not held my hand through the whole process, I think we would have really been, uh, uh, we could have been a grim statistic. Uh, my daughter now lives independently and, uh, and she's made it through school and through college and we're very proud of her achievements, but it is definitely a condition that can be life altering and, uh, you know, things that we take for granted uh, many times these uh, individuals can't, can't do, such as driving, sometimes uh, taking a bath by yourself, um, uh, even riding a bike, climbing a tree uh, can pose real life-threatening situations. Things, again, like I said, that we sometimes take for granted. Um, you know, we become suddenly very acutely aware of the meaning of things uh, when, when uh, one of our loved ones is impacted by this. And so I, I want to thank you, uh, Council Member, for bringing it up. I think it is a, such an important issue. And many times, like I said, people don't know where to get the resources, how to be connected, or how to support their loved ones. You can live a perfectly normal life uh, so long as you get the support and the attention that is required um, uh, before you even have another seizure. So thank you so much. Thank you, Council Member. And thank you to you and to Council Member Foley for sharing your personal experiences of loved ones who are uh, who are grappling with this condition. We appreciate it very much. Uh, any, any other members of the council would like to speak? Okay, let's go to item 2.9. Uh, Councilmember Camus. Thank you, Mayor. And uh, as an immigrant and a former small business owner, I take pride in presenting this proclamation every year. This year, it's uh, more important than ever to recognize our small businesses in San Jose. COVID-19 hasn't just been a threat to people's health. For many of our small businesses, it's been devastating. And despite their struggles, many of them wouldn't trade the opportunity to be an entrepreneur for anything. For immigrants like me, the American dream was often defined as owning your own home and being your own boss. The entrepreneurial spirit is alive and well in San Jose despite COVID-19. And even under normal circumstances, small business owners take high risks, work long hours, and have to overcome many hurdles, uh, bureaucratic and otherwise. Uh, today, we recognize Saturday, November 28th as a Small Business Saturday and ask that you support our hardworking small business community. By shopping local, small businesses in San Jose, residents can promote our community's vibrancy, help support their local economy, and preserve San Jose's unique culture. My own mother is a small business owner, which was affected by you know, COVID-19, as well as countless other friends and relatives comprising the more than 58,000 small businesses that, em that, em that employ over 150,000 people in San Jose. More than half of these small businesses are immigrant owned, and we are proud of the diversity that they bring to our city. Under the current restrictions, businesses can operate at reduced capacity, so be sure to patronize a local restaurant, 
uh, shop at a local small business or order online from a small business. Uh, you know, get in some holiday shopping by purchasing gift cards if, 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 you, um, if you don't want to go outside. And my colleagues and I encourage you to do what you can to help our local small businesses survive and thrive here in San Jose. Shop small and shop local on the Saturday after Thanksgiving on November 28th, which is Small Business Saturday. But get in the habit of shopping every day. Thank you. <laughs> I really hope my wife didn't hear that. <laughs> Thanks, Member Foley. Thank you, Council Member Camus, for bringing Small Business Saturday up. It's extremely important that we continue to support our local small businesses. And every Saturday that we have been in COVID, my office does a little shout out for a small business in District 9 to help shift, send business over there. And I've had people say, oh, thanks for re mentioning that restaurant. I'm really hungry for Indian food. I'm gonna send, go over there. So we need to do what we can to make sure our small businesses sur survive and thrive, but not just on the last Saturday in November. So thank you for mentioning, we should sh shop local, shop small, always. Thank you. All right. Um, We'll entertain a motion now as to the entire consent agenda and let's- Motion to approve the entire consent second. agenda. Okay, motion from Councilman Camus, second from Councilman Esparza, let's vote. Menes? Yes. Corrales? Aye. Dip? Aye. Costco? Aye. Davis? Aye. Esparza? Yes. Reynas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Camus? Aye. Jones? Aye. Licardo? Aye. Okay. Item 3.1 is a report of the city manager. Dave, take it away. Yep, thank you, Mayor. We, uh, we have no report today, thanks. Uh, item 3.3 are actions related to the collective impact grant program, food and necessities distribution by community-based organizations. We have a presentation. Is that yep. from Cohen? Yeah, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Honorable Mayor, Council, members of the public and city staff. Dolan Beckel here, Director of the Emergency Operations Center or EOC, Food and Necessities Distribution Branch. Today's brief one page presentation will be delivered by the Food Branch's Contracts and Fiscal Unit Lead, CJ Ryan. CJ is a rising star in the Food Branch and indeed the city. CJ stepped into the shoes of now Deputy Director Jay Guevara, and we all know those are big shoes to fill. Over the past six months, CJ, in coordination with our city departmental stakeholders, has passionately and courageously powered through over 30 procurements, contracts and grants, and council members to secure millions of additional meals for our vulnerable and at-risk residents during COVID-19. So now I'm proud to turn over the presentation to CJ. Great, thank you so much, Dolan. Uh, good afternoon, Honorable Mayor and Council Members, members of the public and city staff. As Dolan said, my name is CJ Ryan. I am currently the Interim Administrative Officer for the Parks, Recreation, and Neighborhood Services Department, and I am serving as the Unit Lead for the Emergency Operations Center Food Branch. So today I will be presenting a report on the Collective Impact and Unmet Needs Grant Program uh, and the recommended actions allowing the city manager to negotiate and execute agreements with the nonprofit food partners to ensure food security in the city through the end of the year. As you can see, uh, joining me today are Kip Harkness, our deputy city manager and emergency operations center director, and Dolan Beckel, you just heard from the civic Inno innovation director and EOC food branch director. By taking this action, the city is going to be working with multiple nonprofit partners to collectively curb food insecurity in San Jose by providing 480,000 meals to individuals and families hit by both the primary and secondary effects of the pandemic. In order to address the scope, the scale of the food insecurity in San Jose, we knew that we would need to reach out to our community organizations and tap their knowledge of unmet food needs in the community. And so in early September, we released the Collective Impact Grant Program uh, funding opportunity. 
The program was structured as a solicitation for two types of grants. The first, we sought an organization to act as fiscal agent and implementation partner. That would be an organization that would help us administer the three and a half million dollars of coronavirus relief funds that we needed to get out into the community. We had gotten indications from the county that they would be creating a countywide regional governance uh, structure, and this organization would play a role in establishing the groundwork for that future structure. Second, we sought proposals from organizations for what we called unmet needs. That is, it was an open invitation for our partners in the community and faith-based organizations to request financial support for what they identified as their needs to bolster their ability to, cur to curb food insecurity in San Jose. At the close of the application period, we unfortunately did not receive any proposals for the implementation partner and fiscal agent. And according to feedback from several organizations, the role was just too heavy a load for the compressed timeline that we needed to execute it in based on the federal funding restrictions. So the funding that we had initially allocated to that role, we instead granted to the organizations that applied for the unmet needs grants. There were 11 organizations that applied for the unmet needs grant. By having this fairly non-prescriptive grant application, we saw a wide variety of organizations apply. They ranged everywhere from small grassroots organizations like Mama D Second Chance to large organizations like SourceWise. And we also had a wide range of proposals. Uh, some of them, like SourceWise, were to augment existing programs that saw an uptick in need based on the conditions in the community. Others were new programs like the partnership between the Healing Grove Health Center and the Cathedral of Faith, who will be using the funds to provide employment opportunities to individuals who are affected by the pandemic. And those positions will then be helping do the food distribution to address the unmet needs or to address the uh, food insecurity in San Jose. Thankfully, we are in a position there where we can award everyone who applied for a grant with some funding, either directly through a contract or as part of a team that will be delivering the services. So as you can see on the slide, we are recommending that these 10 organizations be directly funded through this program. A few of these programs have subgrantees, and they are as follows. First, we have the Bay Area Community Health uh, Organization who will be using food gift cards as an incentive for residents to get COVID-19 testing and other preventative health measures, such as diabetes testing and flu shots, in order to keep our community healthy. The Downtown Streets team will be providing 200 hygiene kits to our low-income or unhoused residents that they work with in order to stay clean and healthy. The Healing Grove Health Center, as I just mentioned, will be uh, working in partnership with Cathedral of Faith to employ people affected economically by the pandemic and also provide food distribution support to individuals impacted by the pandemic. Hunger at Home will augment their meal distribution program to San Jose residents uh, who are impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. And Loaves and Fishes Family Kitchen will be providing at home uh, meal and grocery distribution services to our residents directly and also in partnership with Martha's Kitchen and Opening Doors 2020. Thank you. Mama D Second Chance uh, will be distributing groceries, meals, masks, and hand sanitizer to vulnerable families and individuals using volunteers to assist in the packaging and delivering of meals. The School of Art and Culture at Mexican Heritage Plaza will be distributing food uh, and providing no cost COVID-19 testing for San Jose residents. SourceWise will be delivering meals to residents affected by the COVID-19 pandemic that do not have other means of preparing meals and doing so through their Meals on Wheels program. Vegilution, uh, through their contract, we will be supporting the Eastside Connect program, which is providing farm boxes and food, uh, vouchers for their farm stand so that residents can pick up or have delivered fresh locally grown groceries. And the YMCA of Silicon Valley 
will be uh, granted to provide staff to support safe learning programs or learning pods and meal distribution for their participating youth and their families. The term dates of these agreements are retroactive to October 15th in order to maximize the use of the Coronavirus Relief Fund, which as you all know, needs to be spent before December 30th of this year. And more importantly, to quickly address the needs of those in our community that are facing food insecurity during this pandemic. Before closing, I do want to thank and recognize the hard work of our unit, uh, including the great leadership of Patsy Cortez, the hard work of Uyen Mai, Fabiola Saucedo, and Jeremy Corrales, among others who made this grant program get off the ground and into the community quickly and effectively. This concludes the presentation and we are available for questions. Great, thank you very much, CJ. All right, let's go to the public. Uh, first, we'll go to the person calling in with the phone number ending 5140. Sure, your device appears still to be muted. I believe you need to push star six, or asterisk six. All right, we're still not able to hear you because your device is muted. Again, you need to push asterisk six if you're on a phone. Okay, we'll go to Blair Bigman. We'll come back. All right, thank you. I had just, uh, I had just a few things to say for this item. With all of the work to, to get food to the people in San Jose with this item, uh, I wanted to remind of the good ideas there can be for healthy food handlers and growers in the Central Valley and for food handlers in, in processing plants. People of San Jose and the Bay Area can know how to offer educational, uh, educated, helpful human rights and worker rights ideas. From Central Valley, farm owners and food manufacturers to understand this can work towards an overall healthier system from the food grown in the ground to the food on our plate. Healthy vegetables, good food, and healthy people in all parts of a food distribution chain and in our society is an important way to address COVID-19 and how to mature from this, med from this pandemic. Uh, and to practice, uh, second part here is, and, and to practice how to offer a good-minded public service announcement, I hope at this point in early November, we are all becoming clear with the idea there may be an expanded rise, there may be an expected rise in COVID-19 cases through the winter, and that we're going to have to work hard so that the previous 70 deaths a week across the Bay Area may only grow to a minimum amount of 100 to 120 a week this fall and winter. For all our efforts and worry at this time, this means to please continue to use caution and safe practices all through the fall and early winter here in San Jose and the Bay Area. Thank you. Thank you, Tessa Wibbenty. I, oh good, thank you so much. Hello, um, I was just going to have a couple of comments. One was about um, food distribution in regards to our local uh, produce distribution that we need to really be always trying to address more than one crisis at a time. And of course we have our climate crisis that we have to keep on the front burner because that's what's really going to start impacting our lives much greater than COVID and the impacts in terms of food security, um, in terms of um, uh, 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 migration, uh, you know, when they become climate refugees, that's what we're gonna be having in our community. So we need to be prepared. And one of the issues in terms of food distribution was we need to go into a fossil fuel free distribution. We need to get a bicycle infrastructure, which is electric to, to transport our foods uh, around our community as we are servicing our neighbors with you know, food insecurity, that we need to be bringing that to them fossil fuel free. And that's what we need to be working on. In addition, the, the greater problem, just like I've been saying is, you know, teach a man to fish, he'll never go hungry. And just providing the food, we need to provide infrastructure where we're growing our own food. This is going to be a really important balm, B-A-L-M, to the mass migration that's gonna be happening in San Jose when people come here looking for help. Okay, so that what we need in our communities 
is places every my husband the biologist master biologist says every five blocks we need to have urban sustainability we need to be growing food this is a bomb for the human soul and this is what we need to be doing um and so we need to be growing food everywhere and and we need to in our community my neighborhood we need to take that 615 stockton avenue and create a a example of housing as well as a uh, urban sustainability, a commons to grow food. Thank you. Uh, Britt Bay, Master, welcome. My name is Brett Bay, Master. I'm executive director of Healing Grove Health Center. And uh, I just want to say how grateful I am to the city. Uh, we are trying to pull off a very complex grant um, on a very tight timeline. And I think CJ and Patsy Cortez and J Jeremy Corrales have been incredible partners to work with. So I just want to uh, pass off to them for your hard work in making this happen. Uh, we're excited at Healing Grove, partnering with Cathedral of Faith, reaching out to serve tens of thousands of families, of hungry families food between now and December 31st, especially uh, moving into the holiday season. And we're incredibly proud to be working with a group of 34 employees who are funded through this program who are behind on the rent and have had uh, lost their jobs because of, of COVID. Um, so what we're seeing is um, uh, low-income families serving low-income families, and that's a beautiful thing. And, uh, you know, we're inspired by the words of Jesus who said to love your neighbor, or love the Lord your God, love your neighbor as yourself. And uh, it, it's just such a joy for us to sit in the food line and watch people from all races and all creeds, all genders, all sexualities coming uh, to receive uh, uh, necessary food and uh, you know, we, we're just looking forward to continuing working with the city. And again, I just want to thank city staff and the city of San Jose for being such good partners in this work. Thank you. Thank you, Brett. And thank you for the work that you're doing uh, with many volunteers. Uh, Rosalinda Rodriguez, welcome. Okay, I think I'm on. <laughs> can you hear me? Yeah, we can. Welcome. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, I am the board chair for East Valley uh, YMCA branch. And it is currently closed. I don't know if you're aware of that. I'm so happy to hear that the Silicon Valley Y is joining as a uh, collaborative effort on this um, grant. And I'd like to encourage the city to um, protect East San Jose area, which I consider, I live in East San Jose. It is one of the most vulnerable areas and one of the hardest hit by COVID-19. Um, and unemployment and the devastation of the uh, employment uh, income, I should say, lack of income. So I just wanna encourage the city to also make sure that um, when the funds are distributed, that they also serve that particular area. It's a concern of mine. Thank you. Uh, the person with the phone number ending 5140. Sure, your uh, device is still. Hello, new. hello, hello. Yeah, welcome. Yeah, it looks like we're looks like we're coming towards another shutdown, less economic activity, all due to the governor that you guys seem to love and post on Twitter. All, you know, it looks like something that Uncle Joe wants to do when he becomes president. All these mass mandates. Who's going to enforce all this? How are you going to have an economy to make to give people the three item, things? Item three point three, which is actions related to collective impact grant agreement. Food necessity. Okay, great. You're going to have a grant for what? For what? To do what? There's going to be no economy to give the money away. You're going to, you're going to be throwing money away to do what? If, if you're going to have a massive shutdown, what's a grant going to do except waste the taxpayers' money? I want you to answer me that, Sam. Can you? I'd like to, I'd like to hear you answer how you're going to get yourself out of this if everything's shut down. And then you guys lecture the public about how we have to shop every Saturday at a small businesses that aren't even open. They weren't open last year in downtown San Jose when there wasn't COVID. So I want, I want someone on the city council to answer some questions about this. What's gonna happen if everything gets shut down because uh, Gavin Newsom, the guy who wants to dictate your Thanksgiving is gonna shut you guys down again. You're gonna follow him like the Pied Eye Piper, man. I want to hear some answers from city council and my local reps, Pam Foley. What do you have to say? 
the item is item 3.3, which are actions related to collective impact grant program food, sir. Do you want to speak on that item? I just did. Okay. Uh, Tessa Woodman, see? She already spoke. She already spoke. Oh, yes. She already spoke. Uh, JT. I hope the majority focus is East San Jose. Sorry. I hope the majority focus is East San Jose. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We'll come back to the council. Uh, Councilman Rennes. Thank you. So I have a couple of questions, but first of all, I just... <laughs> sorry, everything just, <laughs> it's Murphy's Law, right? Um, so I have a, just a couple of questions uh, around um, the programming uh, or the, the grant that's going to be um, designated for the YMCA. Now I understand this is for 15 different sites throughout San Jose, and they're all sites that are COVID impacted. There are um, some school sites, um, as well as YWC, uh, YMCA actual sites, um, and then uh, school sites where the YMC actually works out of, right? Um, and so one of my questions the, is, why do, do we need to provide additional funding for some of those school sites? Um, aren't the school districts bringing in and drawing down some, some funding for, uh, for food that would cover these kiddos? Um, so council member Rain, this is, this is Dolan. So, um, I mean, they're complementary. Our understanding is they're complementary programs. Um, we're happy to reach out to those school districts as we do the negotiate and execute to confirm we're not double dipping, so to speak, and that we're yeah. complementing complementing those programs. But our understanding is is that they, they are separate, but we're happy to confirm that as we negotiate and execute the grants. That would be great, Dolan. I you know I just want to make sure that we maximize the resources. We don't have that many resources, and so the ones that we do, I want to make sure that we are maximizing. Um, the, the best that we can. I, I'm going to guess that maybe they're going to say, because these are after school programs, that, that it, it, if indeed they are after school programs, that this is maybe covering that portion of the day, right? Um, but, but I'd really love to um, hear back to see if that's actually um, so. I know for, for a lot of the school districts, um, they're offering um, not only a meal during lunchtime, they're actually offering enough to have snacks. And, I, and I've seen as much as, as dinner, like a, like a dinner for your child, right? Of course, it doesn't include the whole family, but it's at least dinner for the child. And so I just want to make sure we're, we're not, um, like you said, double dipping here and just maximizing the resources. So what, what, that was the main concern that I had about this. Um, and I'm gonna speak um, a, a bit about some of what I heard um, from some of the speakers. Um, this, the YMCA, um, East Valley YMCA that uh, one of the board members mentioned during comments is in my district. Uh, my district doesn't have very many uh, nonprofits and CBOs working around it. And so we're not very re resource rich, right? Uh, we had to kind of cross King um, to get to a vast to the to get to the vast majority of resources that um, uh, lower income communities typically um, uh, search for. And so for me, um, the pause or closure of this YMCA um, in my district to to focus only on learning pause is is uh, astonishing. Um, as it's going to, um, it's divesting from our community in the east side while we are continuing to invest. And so, um, you know, the order here in terms of investment isn't, I'm not following it because we're investing in the YMCA and yet the YMCA is divesting from resources in our, um, in our community. Now, I know that's a, a little separate from what we're talking here, but it, it comes, um, it, it does come to play in terms of uh, making these decisions about who do we want to fund? What, what type of agency do we want to fund? Do we want to fund somebody who continues to 
uphold some of the programming in the most uh, devastating areas of our of our city. Um, and how do we do that? Um, uh, in, in, instead of, you know, just kind of piecemealing these parts, right? Um, so we give them a little bit for, for, for the learning pods, but yet they're going to close uh, for the majority um, of, of the services in the east side. So I, you know, I'm, I'm a really um, conflicted about this because I want to support it as much as I can, as much as I, uh, you know, as much as I, I am supportive of families and children. That's, you know, uh, part and parcel of my priorities. Um, but I want to make sure first that we are not double dipping, that we are maximizing the school district funding. Um, so that way we can kind of pivot a bit um, and look at some of uh, the other sites that may not be receiving uh, funding um, in the same way. And so like maybe non-school sites. So I think some of the school sites might be, we might be doubling in terms of efforts. Um, and I'll, I'll make uh, some comments later on, but for, for now, those, those are my concerns. I'm not sure that we, there is an answer now but, um, because that Dylan needs you would come back and, and let us know. And so I wonder maybe we could just put a pause on, on, on this grant until we figure this, this whole piece out. Uh Appreciate that, Council Member Arenas. I, I think that at that one location, I, we're, our understanding is the child care and the feeding programs will continue, um, but we can confirm that. And, and the broader issue, um, certainly we're open to uh, granting a, cha a change to, the, to, to this recommendation if, if I'm hearing that we want to grant the other nine uh, and do some more work on the uh, additional on, on the 10th YMCA grant. Right, well, there's, um, let me see, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. There's 10 sites that are at, a, at our schools. And I think I'm doing the counting, right? So the majority are at school sites out of the 15. Um, and so the, the, the majority is in my concern area. So if, if we were to look back, go back to the school district and ask, hey, um, how can we complement these programs that are happening at your school site with additional uh, food? Can we draw some additional money from the sources that you, you already are tapping into? And if the answer is yes, I'm not sure why we would continue to fund this um, as there's already a source for funding for this. Right, so I, th I think I'm hearing the, that recommendation stands will negotiate and execute and ask those questions of the YMCA as we do as we do the negotiation. We we could yes, and you know I, I would like to hear from the the rest of my colleagues, but yes, for now I I, I think we should put a, a pause on some of those school based sites um, as I think we might be double dipping on those. Understood. Okay, anything further? Anything further, Councilmember Reynolds? No? Okay, uh, Councilmember Sparza? Thank you. Um, do we have anybody from the YMCA uh, on, on this call? Are they on it for us to ask them questions? Uh, Henry's gonna try to let them in here. Okay. No, not, not there. Thank you, Henry. And, uh, and hey, could you help by identifying who, who you might be referring uh, to? Mr. White. Oh, is it Mr. White? Yeah. yeah, Mr. White is one of the gentlemen. Yeah. Let me see. Let okay. me look at this. Mr. White, who is on the board, I believe, and spoke earlier. Okay. And uh, is there uh, Rosalinda Rodriguez, I believe, is also Okay. Yes. And we'll, we'll one. let Rosalinda in as well. Um, I'm looking at the list. I don't see anybody yeah. else. Do you, Council Member Arenas? Those are the only two I see. Um, and, and I'll tell you the reason I, uh, thank you for doing that. Um, and the reason I wanted to bring that up is um, I have very similar concerns of us as a city partnering with an entity that's frankly divesting itself from East San Jose. Um, and where we have as staff and everybody is well aware that we have um, a huge amount of need um, the county just made an announcement today 
about the increase in COVID cases, um, which are guess where um, the, the largest number of cases in the county are in East San Jose, um, as well as economic impacts that are felt throughout the city, but particularly in East San Jose. And um, so we have a lot of families that need a lot of services right now and will be needing them over the course of our recovery from this pandemic. And so um, I guess what I wanted to hear from the YMCA is um, I'd like to hear them talk about why they're not offering services um, that aren't city subsidized in East San Jose. Um, it's, it's Rosalinda. Okay. Um, I think those are questions for the administrative office. Um, I know that for our branch, uh, we attempted to open and there was low turnout. And my take on that is that um, because of financial situations and because of um, um, other factors, a lot of our members could not return um, part of it was, was safety. And in reality, the East Valley branch did a wonderful job of moving their equipment so that they were in a, so members were in a safe space. But if there was not um, paying members, then that was difficult for us to stay open. Um, and I, I uh, feel a little out of the loop because I wasn't included in, in that decision. So I can't answer all of your questions, but that's what I know from now. Thank you. Um, I appreciate that. And I um, and thank you for pointing that out, that it was the regional board that made that decision. Um, and uh, is Jill on here? Jill Bourne, is she on the in the meeting? Don't see her on right now. OK, OK. Um, <laughs> So what I, I echo Councilmember Arenas' concerns, again, um, as a city, I'm not, I, I just have incredible reservations of um, partnering with an organization that is uh, pulling out <laughs> of East San Jose, um, leaving a tremendous gap. And um, if that's what they're doing, then perhaps there's another organization that we can partner with, such as the schools, to get this done. Um, and, uh, and Dolan, I, uh, if, and I'm not sure if, if it's you or Dave Sykes or someone else, um, if we could get an answer from Jill Bourne in terms of um, getting some information from the regional board um, that they can provide us that information, uh, provide that information to the city um, to move forward. Because I, I just, I'm not comfortable with the way things stand. Thank you, that's it. Thank you. Uh, Council member uh, Carrasco. Thank you so much. And, and actually uh, my council colleagues have uh, voiced a, a lot of the concerns and the questions that I have. Uh, I wish that there was somebody here from, uh, from uh, the board um, and administration that could answer some of these questions when you're talking about the kind of uh, funding that we're proposed to uh, give an organization like this, uh, it'd be nice to have them here to just answer some questions. So of course, I don't represent uh, the YMCA that's on White Road, but I'm just literally one block away. If if that even counts as a block, uh, you know, I could probably skip from, or I could jump from the corner of my district to where the Y sits. And I've been a member of the Y since I was nine years old. I've raised my four children, uh, you know, um, and they've enjoyed the many different uh, programming uh, that they have there. In fact, uh, I think that's the way that Councilmember Marenas and I uh, got rid of some of our stress while we were all campaigning uh, is that we would hit up those uh, machines and we've been, you know, we've been very active at the Y. So this is coming to me as quite a surprise. I get that a lot of things have closed up because, well, we're in a pandemic and, and that, that, that's natural, but to uh, not have a, a well sought out plan or one that is transparent, especially transparent with the community, I have to tell you, I'm a little disappointed with what I'm hearing. And uh, in addition to the fact that the East side 
has very few amenities when we compare it to other communities. We don't have, you know, uh, uh, really uh, great uh, alternatives uh, other than, you know, using our parks, which is wonderful. But now in the winter, I rely a lot on my local YMCA uh, to get me through the day. And I know that when I'm there, uh, whether it's at seven in the morning or seven in the evening, it's packed. And so I'm, I'm just confused as to what, uh, what the plans are in, in terms of the health and wellness programming. Uh, and, and I want to remind everyone, the YMCA on the east side has been an unbelievable partner, not just right now while we're looking at a pandemic and how we help people get uh, back on their feet, how we help feed or how we uh, create learning pods. But this is a YMCA that we depend on to make sure that our kiddos are off the street, uh, that they have uh, late evening pickup games on their basketball courts. They have one of the tallest uh, rock climbing uh, independent walls. Uh, I, I don't know if you've all had a chance to climb it. Uh, I have tried uh, repeatedly, but my children are very good at it. Um, and, and they have a, a whole assortment and a whole array of programs that I would hate to see suddenly get pulled out of the east side, while especially as we're seeing, you know, some really, really uh, tragic uh, things that are happening on the east side. I'm sure that they're, they're you know, they're happening throughout the whole city because uh, sheltering in place is making us all a little uh, stir crazy to say the least, but just last night we had another homicide on the east side. And I don't know uh, what the root cause of that was. It's still under investigation, but we want to make sure that we're offering our kiddos every chance and every opportunity to not just get them off the street, but to create a culture of health and wellness uh, where families can work out together and can create a culture that is uh, healthier for us. And you know, I don't need to give you the statistics that we've seen in the public health reports regarding what's happening on the east side regarding diabetes, ob uh, obesity, and cardio health. Uh, we, we need to try and preserve uh, all our partners. What I'd like to see is, uh, I know that Jill is on the board. I'd love to get uh, some feedback from her as to what the thinking is. If in the meantime, right now, this is all we're doing is uh, the learning pods and helping to feed at the different uh, sites. And it's something that's needed, I understand it, but um, I don't see how they're going to get back their membership. And then it becomes a spiral um, uh, you know, trip down a rabbit hole, right? You don't have the membership, well, you don't have the cash flow. You don't have the cash flow, you gotta start uh, backing out and uh, cutting down programs. Um, you hope that you'll get your members back, but the reality is you won't get your members back. It's really difficult. And so the YMCA was meant to be a partner with the rest of the community to offer an environment and a culture, uh, not just of wellness, but of belonging, building children's self-esteem, but especially in underserved communities. And my concern really is that when I see which, um, which centers are, are considering um, in terms of uh, being cut uh, or, or are being put on pause. Uh, you know, two of them are in low income communities, one not so much, but we have YMCAs throughout the entire county. And so why the east side of San Jose? I just wanna understand that, why? And, and why uh, in the middle of a community or a district, in fact, three districts, cause we got actually four districts. We got four, five, seven and eight that use that uh, quite effectively. We got folks who are uh, out of, uh, you know, in county pockets that come down and use it as well, but they're still geographically in my district. And so this has been the, these have been the zip codes that have been the most impacted by COVID. Uh, these are the folks who are going to be really struggling to get back on their feet. You know, there's a beautiful gym, by the way, just down the street on Capitol and I think Berryessa, the villas. But you know, unless you're a family that can afford $500 a month to stay healthy and, and uh, fit, uh, you're not gonna be able to afford that. And so most of my residents can't afford $500 a month. By the way, also the YMCA, one of the things that has really put them at the top of uh, everybody's uh, to-do list is that they have a, a great swim program. And, uh, and it's where all of my four children learn to swim. It's where I learned to dive. It's where my daughter was on the swim team. I mean, it offers just such 
such a rich compilation of uh, programs and alternatives that I would hate to see uh, just go away without us giving it a fighting chance and figuring out how we can all come together, city, county, private, public, and possibly even state monies uh, to make sure to ensure that these services continue to be part of our um, repertoire on the east side of San Jose, especially right now, as we're going to try and start looking at how we're going to recover from uh, a devastating pandemic that has just completely had no mercy on the east side of San Jose. So with that, uh, I don't know if you made a motion, council member, but I have concerns about the grant money that we're offering when they're offering to pull out their, their services out of the most neediest, most challenged uh, district or districts, I shall say, uh, in the city. Uh, I wanna, I, I really, I think we're owed an explanation. I was never contacted. I was never brought into the conversation uh, at, as a member as a member, I wasn't brought into the conversation. As a representative of, uh, of, of much of the district that they partner with, I wasn't brought into the conversation. And so this just really concerns me. So I'm gonna ask uh, uh, Dolan or anyone else that's on here, give me some answers so that I feel good about what we're doing here. Because right now I don't feel good. Maybe if I could just butt in for just a moment. If, if there is any value in us convening um, relevant members of the board and, and executive leadership staff of a Y to be able to have a conversation uh, here at City Hall with uh, council members. I'm, I'm happy to, to reach out and try to convene and make that happen if that is of any use, but I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, Dolan, uh, I guess the question is to you or, or to someone on your team. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, there's a, there's a uh, Kip, did you, I saw you start the motion. Go ahead. There's a significant amount of investment in East San Jose if you look across these grants and if you look at the YMCA itself, um, eight, if you if you discount East Valley, seven of the 15 locations are, are located in East San Jose. The, we just literally found out last night about the situation with East Valley. So uh, again, you know, our, our recommendation would be to not pause, but to and get some of these questions answered. And, and move forward uh, with the negotiate and execute. And that convening might be another possible avenue to, to support that. that. That said, you know, again, we are here at, to take your direction so we can make whatever you as a council decide work. Um, we do have all these partners uh, ready to go, but we have not yet um, fully ex uh, negotiated the contract. So there is a little bit of flexibility in how we do distribute either the funds or negotiate and execute those contracts, depending on your will. But our evaluation in this case was based on capacity to deliver food where it's needed. And, and we, we feel pretty strong in, in, in terms of supporting those recommendations, but realize there's a larger picture um, that uh, people are concerned about. So uh, look to you for your guidance on how best to approach that. Okay, Councilman Crosco. Yeah, I, you know, um, uh, again, uh, if we could have some direction and some clarity at some point, because it, it is a much bigger picture. Uh, I, I know that uh, Council Member Arenas, you've been involved a little bit more, at least with the, uh, with some conversations that might be giving you some, some additional info that I don't have. And so I'm going to, um, I'm going to defer to to council member uh, on 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 what we should do right now. I guess the other question I have is, you know, I I appreciate the work that the Y is willing to step up and now do. You gotta, you know, uh, uh, you know, move out of your comfort zone, and sometimes you have to do things a little differently. We've all seen that with the pandemic, but I guess the question I have is, uh, it, at those sites, uh, you know, are are is the Y the only provider that can provide those kind of uh, uh, food distribution at this point? Because they they reduced also their staff, haven't they? So, uh, Councilmember, I think if the question is directed to staff, the um, the 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 one of the large roles of the Y is to augment the staff at those locations. You know, we we kind of have a shortage of, of volunteers um, across the city. And, and actually even agencies that can provide support on food distribution. So one of the primary roles, a number of those locations that the YMCA is gonna be doing is uh, providing staff to help augment 
uh, and complement those services at, at that locate at those locations. There are about 15 locations that they'll be doing, Dolan. Yeah, there's a total of 15 locations. Um, Patsy Cortez in CJ's unit uh, identified that eight of those 15 were located in 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 East San Jose. So uh, one option, just sort of, uh, if I could, uh, because I, I think there's some very good questions that have been raised. Um, we, you know, do have the advantage of uh, being back before council uh, next week. Um, we could separate that item, uh, the Y item from the rest and proceed with the rest and, and uh, seek a convening to seek to understand the decisions um, around services in the east side and, and bring you back further information around the context to allow you to make a decision if that would be helpful. Um, you know, there's some obviously a little bit of delay there uh, in terms of potential feeding, which would be the impact, but we could proceed forward with the other contracts and also potentially be ready to increase those if you were to shift your decision next week, if that provides some space. Again, I don't need to be problem solving for you, so we, we will take whatever direction you feel appropriate. No, I, I, I appreciate that. Thank you, Kip. Um, you know, I, I don't know if there's any other council members that like to speak. I'd like to see how we can come to some sort of a resolution. Again, you know, I, I understand that the much needed efforts that uh, are required, you know, currently but uh but again you know um pulling out or disinvesting in one of the poorest or most challenged communities is very problematic for me uh as it should be i think for all of us who have been advocating for services for our kiddos who have been pushing you know for us to make sure that our kiddos aren't left behind during a pandemic this is really this is really very concerning and um and when i see uh, some of the other centers who are being spared um, that could probably, you know, uh, you know, they probably have a lot of other resources. Uh, you know, uh, the the decision to cut these uh, these services are just very um, concerning and they're alarming to me. Uh, we need to make sure that we invest more and we turn over those keys to our kids versus. Uh, leaving them out. So I, uh, you know, I, I'll I'll refrain for now and see what the rest of my council colleagues have uh, to say. If there's any other opinion, because uh, I, I've, you know, thank you. Uh, thank you. I've been uh, texting just offline here, trying to understand better. This is news to me as well. And um, from what I've been able to discern, it seems to be a decision not made at the local level, uh, but a much higher level. So uh, happy to try to delve further to understand whether there's a role the city can play. Uh, Councilmember Foley. Thank you, Mayor. Actually, that's the point that I was going to make that the East Valley Y probably did not make this decision. The uh, Central Y probably did make this decision based on economic impact uh, of their budget. I, I'm, I'm just guessing. So uh, actually to Kip's recommendation that we potentially approve the funding before us and bifurcate the YMCA, perhaps would it be possible to get uh, the CEO or someone uh, high level from the Y board that made this decision to give us some background? Because clearly there's some information that we're missing on why the East Valley Y was closed and which ones are staying open. I do know uh, that uh, that they are suffering economic loss like everyone else because they are uh, do have reduced memberships all over their their uh, facilities. Um, I used to be on the board many years ago, but so I don't have any inside track, but I know how they discuss things and I know to my council members, uh, Esparza Carrasco and Arenas, they are very much focused on equity. So I'm sure this wasn't a re an easy decision for them, but it might be helpful for the um, CEO or someone high level to come and speak with us to give us some background on, on that. So uh, with, with that, and if, if it's appropriate, I will move, uh, staff's recommendation and bifurcate the YMCA. Okay, by bifurcate, just to clarify. Can, can, I, and can I clarify that? Bifurcate it, time certain next week. 
Okay, so you would defer consideration of uh, yes. the contractors to the Y. Is, yeah. that, is that okay with the second of Councilman Carrasco? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. I, I, I'm sorry, I thought Council Member uh, Arenas was gonna speak, but I- Yeah, I, I, I actually, yeah, I was waiting to, to speak, um, Mayor. I don't know if you yeah. noticed that my hand was up and it was yeah, before. Member, just, you had spoken and, and uh, I'd assumed that you had just left your hand up. And so that's why I went through all the list of people who hadn't spoken yet. But I was going to get it. Mm, no, well, no, can I, no that may I finish before we move on? I just want to say really? that I did that is that I this food distribution is really important and that we get it approved and moving forward for the organizations that are there and uh, then answer our questions uh, uh, about the why next week. But timing is everything. And it sounds like we do have an extra week that we might be able to work with. Thank you. That's it for me. Okay, Councilmember Renes. Councilmember Renes. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. Um, I would also appreciate to to go into order. Um, this is something that is in my district, and uh, Councilmember Foley. As much as I appreciate your uh, gesture in your motion, this is this is my district um, that's being impacted, and. Um, and I would have appreciated to have that opportunity to express what my um, uh, stakeholders have shared with me um, so that we can actually have direction that is meaningful, that is uh, from our area. Um, this is once more being taken out of the hands of the people who are stakeholders and who are um, uh, uh, representatives of the East Side. Um, and so this is exactly what happened um, with our board members, as you heard in our comments. And so right now, it is very upsetting that you're replicating exactly what these board members have expressed to us about feeling uh, left out of the decision making. And so one of the um, items that I I'm was actually not clear on that. I separated out the YMCA to continue the discussion on that. So I'm not sure where you're coming from on that council member Arenas. I, I'm coming from that this is in my district, council member Foley. I, this is I in my district. That. This is an issue that I brought it up and you decided to take the lead on an item that I have um, that I've brought forward as a concern. And so I'm just gonna uh, I'm just gonna do a substitute motion um, to uh, actually, um, I mean, I'm going to reflect exactly what I think Kip had offered in terms of um, moving ahead uh, with the rest of the items, um, the grantees, except for the YMCA, um, and to have a meeting that brings all of the stakeholders together, including uh, council members and uh, board members uh, to the table so that we can have discussion. And we really should have had um, an advocate at the uh, Silicon Valley um, Council, which is a, the regional uh, board that made this decision. And we have Jill Bourne, who is our um, librarian. Um, and, and we weren't given any heads up to tell us that this uh, East Valley site was going to be closed. That's part of the higher ups. That's part of the chain of command um, uh, in terms of trying to ask for accountability here. Um, and we have part of uh, that leadership internally in our city, yet we didn't connect the dots here. Um, so that's my motion. Second. Okay. Councilman Arenas, with regard to the, uh, the allocation to the YWCA, did you want to defer that? Yes, I wanted to defer that is exactly what um, uh, Kip had offered. And I do want to defer that piece until we have the meeting um, with all of the stakeholders. And I uh, appreciate your offer, um, Mayor. This is, is obviously something very concerning to, to many of us who rely on the YMCA for to so many different functions of, um, of our family. Okay. All right, any other comments from the council? Uh, Mayor, just a point of clarification, uh, Councilmember Arenas, is there a, a, a time frame that you want to put on this? Because at the end of the day, people still need to be fed. And so it, it would be helpful if 
if we can have some time frame around it. With regard to the deferral, is that right, Vice Mayor? You're referring, sure. you're referring to the deferral. To the deferral, okay. yes. Yeah. Sure, you know what, I'll leave that up to staff to tell us um, if this is going to impact the service to schools. Um, as I agree with you, Vice Mayor, I wouldn't want that to be disrupted. That's the last thing that I would want to not have uh, children fed. But I'm also very concerned that we are um, not maximizing our resources, like I said in er my earlier statement. And so why would we double dip? Why would we do, you know, why would we fund something that could uh, receive funding elsewhere? Um, and if we really needed to invest in uh, the YMCA in a different manner, then we then then we can make that type of decision. But um, but you know I I, I want to avoid um, I want to maximize our resources. And so I would say like uh, no more than two weeks in terms of bringing this back. I mean if, if we could get this done in a week, that would be wonderful. But I don't know that um, staff has the capacity to pull everyone together. So I would say no more than a uh, two week delay. I would, um, um, I think you did ask um, kind of staff perspective, so I'll, I'll just weigh in a little bit. Looking at the calendar, being very pragmatic, I'm, I'll do what I normally do in the opposite direction, which is, um, you know, two weeks is Thanksgiving. So if it's more than two weeks, it's actually December, by which time we're right on the tail end of our deadline for the coronavirus relief fund and expending those. So I would suggest that we move um, on the staff side expeditiously. Um, have a, a seek to understand meeting with key people from the Y and bring that back along with probably a representative from the Y who you can speak directly to at next council meeting. Because I think part of what we're not able to do very well as staff is represent the Y's decisions and the larger picture. Um, but, but at that point, you could make a call next week, you could make a call whether you had enough information from the Y and felt comfortable proceeding, which we could then effectuate immediately. Or if you didn't, you could uh, direct us to do um, a, a redistribution of those funds to the other grantees, which we could uh, take into account now as we negotiate the contracts with them and, and provide room for that. So um, in, in the opposite of what I would usually say, I think I think next week is probably our best shot to make a decision given the, the timeliness of both the needs and the funds. Um, and you may have incomplete information, but it would be your call whether to proceed or not at that point. And we'd be respectful of, of whatever decision you chose to make. Thank you, Kip. I think I, that's the kind of feedback that I'm, uh, I appreciate. So let's, let's do this in a week's uh, time um, so that we can get through the rest of the items that we need to get through before the end of the year. So thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, Council Member Spartan. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'll, I'll be quick. I actually just wanted to um, ask if uh, at the beginning of this conversation, um, Dolan had also mentioned looking at some of the other funders that if we could, um, as as part of what happens over this next week, if, if we are not able to move forward with um, the East Valley Y, we have other organizations that we're funding, but plus these are school sites because I'm looking at the list right now and these are schools like Rocket Ship um, and school districts that we already work with. Um, and so if there's a way to still get that out to folks that need it, I'm very sensitive. Some of these sites are in my district and I'm very well aware of the need. Um, and so uh, I, I get that, but we're also serving these communities through other partnerships. Um, and so I just ask that you include that in the calculations and negotiations that you're gonna, and discussions that you're gonna be having over the next week. That's it, thank you. Yeah, yeah, we will in terms of sites. The only caveat I would make is we're limited in terms of adding too many partners, either as direct contractors um, because of the nature of the procurement, though it might be potential to add some folks as subs. But I, I, if we, I understand the intent, uh, council member, is to, to sort of see how we could fill that gap geographically with other partners. And we will certainly do that as we move forward with the negotiations with the, the other nine, if you will. Thank, Thank you. you. Right, any other comments or questions? All right, I'm gonna support uh, this mo motion because it appears to be uh, substantially identical to the prior motion. So I'm gonna support both motions. Uh, any other comments? All right, let's vote. Jimenez? Aye. Corrales? Aye. Yep. Aye. Osco? Aye. Davis? Aye. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Camus? 
Aye. Jones? Aye. Ricardo? Aye. All right, thank you. Uh, returning to item 4.1, which is the public release of video footage for police instance of extraordinary public interest. Uh, thanks to uh, city manager's office and the chief for returning this to us relatively quickly so that we could at least put a process in place. I don't think there is a presentation. Is that right, Dave? That's right, Mayor. No presentation, but we are available for questions. Okay, great. All right, uh, let's go to the public first. Uh, Tessa Womancy. We're, uh, we're speaking on uh, the public release of video footage for police and sense of extraordinary public interest. Okay, thank you so much for helping us stay on topic and you know, making these virtual democracies work by letting people know what's going on. And um, Thank you. Um, so basically the public safety issue is the video footage for police incidents of extraordinary public interest. And the thing that was concerning to me when um, 2016 happened and my son was protesting Donald Trump and he was harassed uh, down in city, um, at the city by, there was a big protest on Santa Clara, on San Fernando, and, and it was just a lot of abuse. And I had to go ahead and write a letter to the public, you know, to the police, you know, what we call whatever that protections are that we're trying to strengthen, nothing came of it. And I, and I was always thinking about it. It's like, why wasn't there uh, video footage of what happened that I could have seen exactly what happened? You know, because it was my report from my son that he was abused and it was a very aggressive behavior as he was on his bicycle and the police came with their car and just went in front of him and like almost, you know, they, they were really like attacking the, um, uh, the, the protesters. And this was in 2016 when it wasn't as you know volatile as it's become more so. Um, and so, you know, when we're looking at these issues, we really need that video footage to be shown to us. Um, you know, when I, when I um, filed my complaint with the officer or whatever it was, you know, and it came back, no problem. And there was nothing, you know, that, that shouldn't have been the way it was. There should have been police footage that I could have seen and verified that, that there was an aggression. And, you know, and, and that, that type of thing. So that's really critical as we go forward to uh, make sure we have everything on tape and to really uh, evaluate the, the police, you know, which is another, another whole level is that we need to not be as aggressive, you know, this militarization of our police force is where we create the violence, where they have the cars, where they can run into you and the, the guns and, you know, we need to demilitarize. All right, thank you. Uh, Mr. Beekman? All right, thank you. Um, thank you for addressing how to make body camera footage, footage more accessible under extraordinary circumstances. It seems this allows a way for cities to have some control with state law and its accessibility issues with the public. Thank you again also for the January 22nd Rules and Open Government meeting that formally tried to address in a public hearing how an everyday person can get body camera footage for their court appeal process. This sort of idea of public accessibility should be obvious and needed. I hope it can be worked out at the state level in the next few, few months and years. From these civil rights and civil protections and human rights issues in the next few years, we are going to have to start to a new more open review of body cameras soon and what sort of cancer rates they're causing among police officers continuously wearing this radio frequency microwave technology on their chest. If you're trying to think honestly about ideas of sustainable future, police officers having to wear body cameras may no longer be such a viable trade-off to the claims of community accountability as the civil rights and civil protections of the everyday public is not being given accessible avenues to body camera footage and that police officers themselves may be weighed down with such equipment uh, and its life expectancy issues. From this, a police officer simply may not make or may not want to make or may not take the time to make more positive, better decisions out on the street, on the job, or on patrol. Accountability makes initial body camera ideas very good. I hope these ideas, uh, these sorts of words can help develop uh, a more open dialogue on the subject of the current health and sustainable decision-making by police officers and the need of better public accountability to simply be more allowed to review body camera footage at times of court trials and such. This is not a war. This is our future of sustainable peace and practices. Let's learn how to work and act that way. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, JT. 
giving body cameras uh, camera footage sooner actually will reduce and officers being more honest. Uh, JT, your uh, device is muted right now. Okay, I think you've completed. All right. Uh, the person with the phone number ending 5140. Yeah, I'd like to see more body cameras, but uh, they have discretions where they can turn them on or off. Uh, I, you know, I wish in 2016 when the Trump supporters were being beaten down by the thugs that you called in, Sam, uh, I wish there was body cameras then to watch all those 250 officers stand down and absolutely do nothing. They weren't even playing pocket pool that day. You were forced into having to apologize, both you and your buddy, Eddie, for uh, what sir, you did that day. Uh, Luckily, there were new cameras. You to speak to the entire council and not to address anyone individually. Okay. Anyway, yeah, and I don't care if the cameras give them cancer. That's what happened with the radar guns. They were giving people cancer. Who cares if a cop gets cancer? I don't because they're worthless. They can't even come out for anything. And, yeah, they need to wear cameras to, to, you know, so you can see what kind of bad attitudes they have and how smug and arrogant they are and watch them just say there's nothing they can do. So, yeah, make it more cameras all the time. Make it so they can't turn them off. Why should they be able to turn off the camera at their discretion? I, I, I call nonsense on that. And uh, as for addressing you, Sam, that's just too bad. You're open to public scrutiny. This Sir, is the I'm sorry. You won't be allowed to speak individually to any council member. Uh, you're to address the entire council. Uh, Karina? This is not really to address the, the council. I just am shocked that that person right before you was so incredibly inappropriate and that was just unnecessary so if that person is still listening shame on you wishing cancer on anybody especially the police i'm that's all i wanted to say i'm totally irrelevant but that's just inappropriate thank you thank you uh, returning to the council uh councilmember Sparza. thank you mayor um I had a couple of questions. So who in the city has the final authority to approve an officer's requ request to redact certain footage when it reveals the identity photograph or other private information? So the resolution states that the final determination will be made by the city, but it doesn't kind of specify how that would happen. And does the PD have the final authority in that in that scenario, or who, how, how does that work? Well, I'll that question for Nora or, or Dave. Sorry. Uh, so, thanks, Council. I'll start off. I think that I mean ultimately, um, you know, there's um, laws that govern the the release of uh, under certain circumstances the identity of officers that are in the PRA laws and the government code. But ultimately, that would be a decision um, of the city attorney's office and the city manager's office. Okay. And if I'm incorrect, Nora it, can. No, that's that. That's correct. Um, if it if there were certain laws that were implicated, um, then we would weigh in on that. Um, but there. Uh, Generally, the release of videos is subject to um, the uh, Public Records Act. Um, there are times when uh, the district attorney is doing an investigation and, and has requested that we not release that information. So all those things are taken into account. And then so, for example, the PD would do uh, that threat assessment, and then that would be bumped up to the city attorney's office and the city manager's office to make that final determination. Is that correct? Under this policy, yes, it appears so. Okay. And All right. Yeah. Okay. Um, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, is there a motion on this item? Move approval. I'll second. Okay. Okay, thank you. There's a motion and a second. Again, I want to thank um, the relatively rapid response. I know that we had some challenges given all the workload right now in the police department. So um, I essentially suggested a framework for this policy. I don't pretend that it's going to be 
the perfect one, but I, uh, I know that it may require some tweaking going forward, but I think it was important for us to get a policy in place so we could rapidly respond when there is uh, public uh, inquiry for the video footage. And hopefully this will be uh, another step in our, our effort to continue to, to build um, trust in our community and uh, thank the police department for, for pushing forward. All right, let's, uh, let's vote, Tony. Anas? Aye. Prowlis? Aye. Kip? Aye. Crosco? Aye. Davis? Aye. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Amos? Aye. Jones? Aye. Ricardo? Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Item 8.1 is an update on the sixth cycle regional housing needs allocation, also known as RENA. Uh, there is a presentation on this. There is. Can you hear me? Yes. Welcome. Welcome, Michael. And I guess I need to share the screen, do I? Yes, you do. Okay, hang on a second. To commend you, Michael, for having a fire extinguisher nearby, always safe. Yes, things always, uh, you never know what's going to happen. <laughs> right, here we go. Well, let me just go back to one, give me one second. Okay. <clears throat> are you seeing the, the PowerPoint? We are, yeah. Perfect. Okay. Well, thank you. Sorry for that little technical. Snafu. Um, I'm Michael Brio, um, Deputy Director of Citywide Planning, and I just want to note that I'm joined by our, my, our Director, Rosalind Huey, as well as um, Division Manager of Citywide Planning, Jared Hart, and the leader of our uh, housing team is, is Ruth Coetto. She's also joining me today. So today we're here to discuss the RENA allocation process and what the implications of that process are for San Jose. So a little, little, uh, first let me start a little background on, on the housing element. So um, the Envision San Jose has, general plan includes seven state mandated um, elements. Um, one of them is our housing element. It's the only one that is the required to be updated on a, on a regular and uh, defined basis. The, the housing element actually has to be updated every eight years. We are currently in our fifth cycle. That's our current cycle, which runs from 2014 to 2022. And we are going to be entering and we're updating the housing element really starting now for our sixth cycle, which runs from 2022 to 2030. And the deadline to submit a valid housing element to HCD is January 1st of 2023. So the housing element process really begins with the RENA allocation process. And RENA stands for RENA Regional Ho Housing Needs Allocation Process. And that's largely what we're going to discuss today. So the way it works is the state of California, the Department of Housing and Community Development, often referred to HCD, they calculate the, the need for housing for each region in the state of California. So they calculate the need for the, the nine county Bay, Bay Area, that's the area governed by ABAG. They then give that number to ABAG and then ABAG creates an allocation methodology to take that larger Bay Area number uh, and, to, and, and, and it's a methodology that then assigns it to all the individual jurisdictions within the Bay Area. Uh, then that number, when it's, it's finally blessed by HCD, goes to each jurisdiction, for example, the city of San Jose, and then as part of our housing element process, we need to identify sites that can accommodate our allocation. And then we didn't need to list uh, an implementation plan and implementation policies and programs that will get us to achieve developing that housing and, and further um, uh, fair housing, uh, which is really, really an important part of, of the RENA process this time. Um, and so, uh, 
One thing to note is that a compliant housing element, meaning you have to have it certified by the state of California um, to get to become eligible for a, a number of different state and regional funds for transportation, parks, affordable housing, et cetera. So it's really, really important um, that we get this work done. And I'm gonna go to the next slide, excuse me. So there was a, a lot of sort of anticipation about what the Bay Area's allocation would be. And it turns out to be 441, 000, over 441,000 new homes. Um, this is a 135% increase over our current or fifth cycle, cycle arena allocation for the Bay Area. It is an increase, but it's not as high as we anticipated. For example, the Los Angeles metro area received a 225% increase. I should note that the primary inputs into uh, this allocation for the Bay Area was household growth or projected household growth by the year 2030. But more importantly, in many ways, was the existing low vacancy rate that we have in the Bay Area and the high overcrowding rate, i.e. the housing crisis, really trying to meet the existing housing need as much as the future housing need. So uh, the process by which ABAG um, establishes a proposed methodology to divide up this larger Bay Area number was to establish a committee, the Housing Methodology Committee, and they work with staff to develop this, um, this, this, this proposed allocation uh, methodology. And the HMC met 12 times between October of 2019 and September of 2020. And it consisted of 37 members representing multiple jurisdictions and stakeholders, including elected officials, uh, uh, staff from various jurisdictions and affordable and market rate housing developers and housing advocates. I was a member of this committee. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the process uh, to develop a methodology and what's in it. It's a bit complicated. So I'm gonna to try to simplify it as much as I can. Feel free to ask questions when I'm done. But um, the, the first, when you're developing the RENA allocation methodology, the first uh, thing you need to do is establish a baseline. And that's just the base amount of units a jurisdiction would get before you start adding all kinds of factors that would lower it or raise it. Um, and the, the staff recommended, the ABAG staff recommended that we use the, the Plan Bay Area 2050 blueprint as the baseline allocation. And that really made sense um, because aligning the two is, is a requirement of state law. Secondly, um, the RENA allocation methodology is an opportunity to actually implement the strategies in the blueprint. So while that looked good on the surface, the way it was done was that the, 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 the baseline was using uh, future household, projected future household, household growth for each jurisdiction as the baseline. What that means is an example of a hypothetical community. If your city um, had 20% of the projected household growth between now and 2030, you would get 20% of the Bay Area's RENA allocation. And that's just sort of the baseline of what you would get. Um, that had an, an unfortunate consequences for San Jose and the South Bay. So, um, this would result in San Jose receiving 23% of the total allocation for the Bay Area and all the jurisdictions with Santa Clara County receiving 45% of the Bay Area's allocation, even though they have around 23 or 24% of the population. So it was a huge hit to the South, South Bay. Um, Dave Sykes and the Santa Clara County Cities Association separately wrote letters expressing concern with this. The committee, the Housing Allocation Committee, the HMC also expressed concern because they felt that the um, allocation, the housing growth should be spread more evenly across the Bay Area and that there are many high resource communities that are jobs rich that also should take on their fair share of the housing. So in response to um, our concerns and the HMC's concerns and, and feedback, ABEG staff came up with a modified approach. They still recommended using blueprint as the baseline but instead of just looking at future ho households of a community to determine how the allocation, how much a city would get, they looked at total households in the year 2030. So that was a combination of how many households do you have now or in 2019, and what was your projected growth? And 
this approach was really intended to address the region's equity issues and spread the housing allocation more evenly across the Bay Area. So this is ultimately the baseline that the HMC recommended to the ABAG board. The, ABAG, the HMC also added some factors to, to modify that baseline for different jurisdictions, really focusing on whether your community was a high resource community, and if it was, you should get more, and were you a jobs rich or pro proximate to a jobs rich area, in which case you should get more, and if you were not, then you'd get less. On October 15th, 2020, the ABAG board uh, 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 review the, um, the committee's recommendation and then approve release of the HMC's recommended methodology for public input and review. So, so what did it, so what, what, um, so what is the effect of using the uh, modified blueprint baseline? So what it did is for the Santa Clara County, it reduced um, our share uh, from about 45% of the, of the Bay Area's alloc total allocation to about 33%. So it did reduce it a lot. Mind you, we still take the heaviest share. It's almost, it's almost more than double any of the other counties in the region. So if you look at that chart, you can see we're at almost 33%. Alameda County is the next highest at uh, just above 19%. So we're still taking a lot, a lot, a, a, a big share. Let me go to the next slide, excuse me. Um, what does it mean for San Jose? So San Jose's allocation is anticipated to be uh, just about 66,000 or 66,500 units, which is almost a 90% increase um, from our current RENA, the RENA that we have in our current fifth cycle housing element that's in effect right now. So that sounds like a pretty big increase. I just thought it was worth noting that relative to the other cities in our county, we um, are not getting quite the uh, a, a, a significant increase. For example, Palo Alto is getting over a 400% increase. Um, Cupertino is getting almost a 500% increase and Mountain View is getting an increase of almost 289%. So we really got uh, probably the lowest um, one of the lowest, if not the lowest uh, increase of the, of the jurisdictions in the county. Um, so given that the Bay Area's RENA is higher um, our and our total RENA is higher, it means that all of our income levels, all of the RENA at our various income levels increase. So if, if you recall, um, the, the RENA is broken up into various income levels, which probably sound familiar to you. So it's there's a total number of of 60, over 66,000 units. And then what's broken into very low income category, low income, moderate, and an above moderate. So just a slight change from last time is that our allocation is leaning a little more on the above moderate and less on the low, the low income and moderate categories. And, and the reason really for that is that San Jose is not one of those high resource communities like some of the communities that are cities in the, in the county surrounding us and elsewhere in the Bay Area. And so the focus of the methodology was really putting, furthering fair housing, um, providing more access to opportunity and putting the lower income categories and in higher resource, higher income communities. So why does this matter? Well, um, it's not a huge change, but uh, planning for, uh, for uh, moderate, above moderate income is a lot easier. It has, there's a lot less requirements and restrictions as we do our housing element. So that, that makes our work a little bit easier, um, but we still have a lot to plan for. So um, let me tell you a little bit about, some of you may have heard about this. There were some unattended consequences of using the blueprints total growth methodology that's been selected um, by the ABAG board to move forward. Um, and that the, the implications of that are that the counties and allocation, when I mean the county, the unincorporated county significantly increased. It went from 277 units in the fifth cycle arena to 40, over 4,100 units. This is a 1,394% increase. This was really an unintended consequence of the, of the methodology because the methodology is now looking at a, uh, an existing jurisdiction's existing households to determine their share of the overall arena allocation of the Bay Area and not just their growth. So that's an unintended uh, 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 a consequence. 
There was an assumption that Bay Coyote and Almond and Valley Urban res Reserves could be developed. Um, however, we, the staff have been meeting with ABAG and providing documentation to show them that in the case of Mid Coyote, that's not likely to develop. We gave them, uh, gave them a language from our general plan, um, the, the recommendation of the task force and the staff on Mid Coyote, a number of policies explained a lot of different factors that, that convinced the ABEG staff that Mid Coyote should not be included in, in the allocation methodology as a place where housing growth would go. And they agree with that. So that will have some dampening effect on the um, number of units going to the county, but the county is anticipated still to get a large number because um, the number is being driven by existing households in the county more than uh, its projected household growth. So the resolution that the ABEG staff recommended was that the cities in the county agree to shift sort of their share uh, of, of the amount of, of growth that they have in their sphere of influence as unincorporated county from the county into their cities. So for San Jose, for example, depending on the methodology used, that could mean that San Jose would agree to take on about a little over 1,500 units to upwards of 2,200 units from the county and bring them into San Jose and increase our allocation from roughly 66,000 to 68 or so. So um, this, this proposed uh, methodology or, or approach, I should say, is not likely to um, gain traction because we anticipate that cities like Palo Alto will not agree to it. So all the cities in the county have to agree to this methodology or this approach, and we don't anticipate that that's going to happen. So um, the county is now leading this effort, uh, county planning staff. And they are going, they're working with other approaches to address this issue with ABEG staff. So next steps in the process. So the, the RENA, the proposed RENA allocation methodology is currently under public, in a public comment period, it runs from October 27th and ends on November 27th. Um, during the public hearing, uh, the, the Regional Planning Committee will be meeting on November 12th to discuss the methodology and hear feedback. Um, and then there's an executive board meeting on January 22nd um, where the board decides to, to, uh, whether to submit the, the, the proposed methodology to HCD, the state of California for their blessing. Then HCD will assign the final arena allocation to the Bay Area local governments in late 2021. So planning staff are already getting a jump start in this. We don't want to wait. This is a very significant body of work that has timelines that will not that are not bendable. So we are collecting data. Data. We're making preliminary capacity estimates, and we're already starting the uh, process of identifying sites um, that for for to, to to accommodate our housing allocation. We're also developing an outreach program, and intend to to be initiate our outreach in the spring of 2021, really sort of just starting with a sort of housing element 101 and explain the process and get some preliminary input, input and feedback from the community. Um, the city's housing element, as I mentioned, is due to HCD on January 1st, 2023. And that's a hard and fast deadline. And we really need to get it done by the fall, um, get it to council in the fall of 2022 to make that deadline. And that concludes my presentation and we'll open it up for discussions and Q&A. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and thank you for your uh, work, Michael, uh, with uh, all the regional partners. We know that RENA is a very heavy lift and it's not a four letter word for nothing. Okay, uh, <laughs> Blair Beekman. Hi, uh, Blair Beekman here. Uh, thank you for this item. It's the first time I'm learning about housing, how housing works in the Bay Area. It's interesting that it, it, it's a cycle series and you're explaining you know, years and decades of planning and it's, ni it's nice to be around this kind of thing. Thank you. Um, you know, I've been attending you know, just a few meetings and I'm ready to hit it out of the park and just you know, ask what are the creative good ideas that, that you can work towards at this time. Um, CASA advocacy 
they came to uh, Sacred Heart about a year or two ago, and they needed help with, with MTC ideas of what can be mixed income ideas. This was two years ago. And CASA returned to them, I think, a really good report that at the same time, City of Santa Clara, San Jose, you know, they were working on VLI and ELI ideas that were of interest and mixed income too. And so, you know, um, where is that going to fit into this kind of thinking? And with all the talk of a uh, defund at this time, you know, how to build the future of housing is incredibly important at this time. And I know the MTC, I just have learned that they want to make steps how to address state bureaucracy and how it can be easier for the local level to work through their VLI and ELI programs that can work through the current state bureaucracy. Uh, how does that fit into this cycle series? Um, you know, good luck on how to do that and uh, what we all need to work on. I heard Re Rena sounds like a queen to me and there's, there's other programs within a MTC and ABAG and a program called BAFA, which is funding sources. There's experimental programs. There's different programs to, to look into with, with the MTC. So good luck with this issue. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the person with the phone number ending 5140. Yeah, it was a nice presentation and everything. Um, but my question is, where's all this money going to come from so middle and higher income people can afford housing? Like, I find it a bit odd. We're, we keep we we keep subsidizing every level of people. Is it going to be super wealthy people going to get a subsidy next? I don't know. I just know there's a lot of acronyms being thrown around. It's like a uh, – looks like something from 1984, all these different uh, – Alphabet agencies acronyms a bit weird to me. It's unbelievable uh, what we're doing and what we want to be by 2050. Most of us won't even probably be around by the time this comes to fruition. Maybe that's why you guys are starting now. So the people who are who are here now would definitely fight what's going on. But the people in 2050, they'll they'll be so beaten down. You'll see, they won't care. They'll just they'll just be happy to get the subsidies and and uh, worship big brother, I guess. I don't know. But I just, my question is, where does all this money come from? Nobody can answer me. You know, I'm going to address the council. Uh, I don't want to say your name, whatever your name is now. Can't say it. It's a secret, right? Uh, we know who you are. Anyway, I want the council to know where all the, I want to know where all the money comes from. Someone answer that. No one wants to answer my questions. They're too difficult. They're too real. It's not, it's not like Tessa calling up or whoever. You know, the person who berated me last time about uh, my attitude or whatever. Anyway, I want to know where the money is, and I want to know one thing. When's the last time any of you on the council has thanked the taxpayer for what we do so you guys can dole out, dole out the freebies? I'd like to know, have you ever, ever thanked the taxpayer in a newsletter, a tweet, on a city council meeting? I'd like to know. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Tessa Woodman, to you. Thank you. The issue of housing is a very big issue that is really a problem in our city. I've seen it in three examples of it. One with the hotel that was being built next to my house in our historic neighborhood and that we didn't even know about. Our council member didn't know about it. And then the same council member, Deb Davis, in regards to Willow Glen, it's happened three times in our community where jobs first, has overridden our housing, um, I, I, housing, you hear me, right? Hello, do you hear me? Yes, we can. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Jobs first, the 2040 I plan. I your comments to the entire council. Okay, I'm directing it to the entire council. Yes, it's jobs first that has been the priority of the business friendly um, council members in, in District 6, which is specific because I'm hearing about it. It happened when we were on Lincoln Avenue at Kirtner when they wanted to build housing, but they said, Deb Davis said no to that one. And then it was the same issue that happened just, I heard last night at the SAG meeting with uh, Kevin Chrisman and the issue of the yoga studio, that they wanted housing and they got a yoga studio and they didn't want that. The neighborhood didn't want it. It's not what we need, but it's all about jobs first. And I say it's a, it, it is evil, immoral, um, selfish and greedy. It's trying to get to bolster City Hall, the pockets of City Hall, 
That's what you want is the, you want it from the hotel transient taxes. You want it from the businesses and you don't appreciate the, the residential. We know that you always say that we cost too much. And this has been the real, the real bottleneck of our housing crisis is this emphasis on jobs. When first of all, our jobs are going away because we need to deal with work, which is growing food. We're going to have to get back to survival. That is where we're going. COVID-19 is telling us that, that we need to stay home. And that is also another thing that you're fighting um, in terms of that, um, uh, in terms of ABAG with uh, Mayor Licardo fighting, staying home. The fun is on here. Thank you. He's not. Uh, if I could ask everybody to please mute themselves. Thank you. Uh, Catherine Hedges. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor Ricardo and the council. Um, a couple of things I like to say, it seems that the current, you know, this proposed housing plan is emphasizing putting uh, missing middle housing in San Jose instead of low and very low income housing. And I understand not wanting to have, you know, perpetuate, you know, low income neighborhoods. I don't know if People from Elm Rock will necessarily get this housing that's up in Palo Alto or whatever, but it seems that a good way to incorporate the missing middle type housing into the city without gentrifying places like Elm Rock would be to allow multiple, you know, ban the single family housing zoning that covers 93% of the city. Um, because the people in the missing middle, you know, moderate income ranges, they're the ones who'd be able to afford to rent or buy the, you know, four on one type of properties. They're not, you know, those are going to be too expensive to make into uh, very low or extremely low income housing anyway. And another point is regarding the creating new jobs, I think that working from home is going to be a big trend in the future. And instead of building a lot of office space so people can come to an office and work, if people are working from home, then they can work, you know, then they're working from home. They don't need to have a big office building built for them. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. All right, let's return to the council. Councilor Davis. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Michael, I have a couple of questions. This is my first uh, RENA cycle. And what I'm curious about is probably what I'm always curious about that I still haven't figured out about planning in general is how, how does the HCD or ABAG know what the market wants. They, when you talk about household growth projections, for example, what is that based on? If you could be, if you could explain it a little bit more, I, I get that it's complicated and I, I just think I would, I would like a little more explanation about that. Sure. So the way I understand is that when they, they're, they're projecting household growth, they're looking at, um, job growth, they're looking at birth rates, they're looking at Im immigration trends, and they're projecting that out. So that's, that's my understanding of, of how they actually end up projecting what the overall Bay Area growth would be. And so when you're talking about job proximity, I mean, we have fewer than one job for every employed resident but Palo Alto has almost four, if I remember correctly, or at least it's over three. Correct. So do they have, when, when, when you take that into account, wouldn't you say that the demand for housing would be greater in Palo Alto than it would be here, assuming that people want to live near where they work, which I assume that they do. I know I have that preference and I think many people do. Yeah, so correct. So the, the methodology does, um, basically its approach is what you describe. It's putting the jobs 
in jobs rich communities or communities that are proximate to jobs rich areas. So Palo Alto again got uh, over a 400% increase. Now their absolute number is much lower than ours. I think it was around 10,000 units. But as a percentage increase, it's a very large increase. Um, so the, the methodology really is about focusing the jobs into jobs rich parts of the Bay Area, so particularly the South Bay, and then high resource, high opportunity communities. So Palo Alto hits it out of the park on both of those things. San Jose does not, and that's why we have a relatively low allocation. So our overall number is higher because of our large geographical area? Well, everybody's number went up. I mean, we the Bay Area, again, the arena allocation for the Bay Area increased by 135%. But San Jose's is only going up by just under 90%. So we're actually increasing, oh. we're, we're our growth rate, so to speak, is less than the, the growth rate for the whole Bay Area. Right, but if we're trying to, so for every additional unit of housing, we have to then, we will have to then accommodate for more jobs if we want to get to a more reasonable job to employed resident ratio is that is that correct well right so we have we have the a capacity for jobs to achieve to um, meet our arena allocation and achieve our jobs goals it's not so much that isn't so much the issue the issue is actually achieving those jobs that we have planned but we don't you know i think the other thing is um what we were fearful of or a little concerned about was that our allocation from Reno was so large that we would have to add more housing capacity to the general plan and do a whole new EIR for that. And our allocation is low enough that we don't need to do that. So we can stay within the plan capacity of our current general plan. So it's really more about achieving the jobs that we've planned and achieving the housing we've already planned in our general plan and not adding more jobs or housing at this point with, to the general plan. For our 2040 general plan. Correct. Now that may change in the next housing element cycle, quite frankly, I anticipate it would, but I would also wouldn't be surprised if we're doing a comprehensive update of our general plan in that in that same time frame. Right. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Um, Councilmember Menes. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. I uh, appreciate all the work on this. Uh, and uh, I am astounded by the number of units, even though it seems like it's uh, the allocation is probably smaller than what we anticipated, but it's still a lot. It's sixty-six thousand or so. Um, so, so my goal. I, I stepped away for a few moments during the course of your presentation, but I did look through it, and I was looking in there to see if there was anything related to. I think some of the um, comments uh, that my office made in the memo we submitted, and I and I suspect that some of my team has reached out. But I'm I'm curious if you can provide an update as it relates to the. Um, the work aligning the zoning code with the general plan and how that's going and, and when do you think that's going to be done? I know it's a long-term effort and there's a lot of work to do in that space, but. Sure. Thanks for answering, answering that, asking that question, Councilmember Jimenez. I actually was planning to grab the bull by the horns and address your comments in the memo, but I just flew through my presentation. So okay. thanks for prompting me, but um, yeah. So again, right. So if you all remember a couple of years ago in 2018, the council, directed staff to align our zoning with the general plan. And I guess it's great minds think alike because the state of California also now requires us to do that under SB 1333. So they kind of happen in the same time frame. So we're in the process of aligning our general, our zoning with our general plan. And it's really broken into, I would call it three phases. First is phase one, which is modifying just our zoning ordinance to conform to the general plan. Sorry about that. Um, and uh, that actually work has been done. The city council approved those changes in um, June of 2019. Then there's phase, what we're calling phase 1B, um, and that's creating new zoning districts in our zoning code that align with the general plan land use designations. And we d often do not have zoning districts that conform directly to our general plan land use designation. So we'll be creating urban village zoning districts, one for commercial, one for housing and mixed use, um, one for transit 
uh, residential, urban residential, mixed use neighborhood, mixed use commercial, et cetera. So we have those zoning districts. Um, that work we're working on right now, we actually have a community meeting um, coming up on November 12th. Um, and, um, and we anticipate bringing these, these zoning districts to, we're, I should mention, we're also doing focus groups with the development community and others just to sort of get their feedback on these districts. Um, we've been working with ULI on developing just to sort of ground truth and to make sure that what we come up makes sense from a developer point of view. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll be bringing these to council. Uh, we're anticipating March of next year, 2021. Okay. So that, that's the update on, on, on that phase 1B. Now phase two is the larger body of work and that's actually rezoning the 30,000 or so properties within the city of San Jose that have zoning that's inconsistent with the general plan. And that's probably gonna be a two to three year process. Um, we're, we're not gonna be doing one property at a time. We will be grouping large pro groups of properties together and taking them in batches where okay. that makes sense. I mean, that's, our, that's our approach. Uh, okay. And um, our focus really is going to be um, on a couple different things. One is really to be zoning land that's planned for housing in the general plan for housing with our new zoning district. So that's priority number one. Um, our other priority is to, is to um, uh, correct some, some issues that we've been having with um, inconsistency with the general plan and the zoning as it relates to is housing allowed, for example, in industrial or commercial areas. That's sort of a secondary mm -hmm. tier. Um, yeah, so that that's I would have so how to break it down. And then another uh, another priority area is is making sure that areas that are planned for agriculture and open space that um, are zoned for housing, those are are rezoned to an ag or open space um, zoning district consistent with the general plan. So those are kind of our three priority areas. Okay. Um, regarding um, zoning and, and, and RENA, um, so we're creating the zoning districts that will help us um, rezone land to uh, basically accommodate arena allocation, but the we don't have to do all of this work before housing element certified. We have two years upon certification to actually go back and rezone the land. Mm -hmm. That being said, there are it gets very complicated, but the, if there are affordable housing sites that were not developed that were we identified in our previous, or I should say our current housing element that we want to re reuse in this upcoming housing element we're gonna to have to rezone those sites for affordable housing. So there is gonna be some zoning work that needs to happen. And I kind of touched upon your comment about the RENA outreach process. We're, we're really planning, Ruth Cueto is really planning a robust um, outreach process that will reach out to many communities, many stakeholder groups, underserved communities. Um, we're gonna have large community meetings. We're gonna have focus groups, really to get a broad swath of input, um, planning to do it in multiple languages as well. And that process, she's developing the outreach approach right now, but we're planning to really kick it off with just sort of a, almost an orientation and give people sort of background on what is this housing element? What is the arena process? That would kick off in, um, in the spring of next year. And, I, and let me know if I, any other questions you'd like answered. You, you touched on a lot, uh, but, but I think I, I appreciate you ending on uh, outreach because as we know, as we're moving forward, trying to meet this, uh, the, the allocation, it, it may in fact just fundamentally change some of the dynamics and some of the, the, the layout of some properties in, in the districts across the city, right? And so I think it behooves us to really uh, uh, get ahead of the game and, and, and educate our residents and bring them into the fold so that way they understand uh, with that when they start seeing some changes in their neighborhood, why those changes are required uh, in many cases by the state and, and, and why we, we need more housing. And so uh, I think that that component is going to be very important. Uh, a question I have just in the different phases you were outlining, in which phase would the work as it relates to some of the mobile home parks come in? I, I know obviously that's something that comes to, to the forefront uh, every now and again during conversations about uh, density and, and just preserve preservation of housing and such. Where, where would that come in? Yeah, I mean, I think that could be considered in phase two, but it really isn't tied to those phases. So in some cases, there could be general plan land use changes that are needed and zoning or zoning. So that's a different body of work that's really tied more to our housing crisis work program. And the issue is that we, we there, that, that's a, a pretty large body of work and we'll need resources to do that. So the council 
will need to allocate resources for staff to do that work. Um, and I think, unfortunately, this is one of those things that COVID came along and sort of put a little bit on, on hold for a moment. So we, we can, we need to revisit that and, and, and have councils work with us to identify resources to do that work. Okay, all right. And, and you know, when I look at the 60,000 plus uh, units or, 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 you know, we're gonna have to build out, I, I guess the fundamental question for me is how, how do we do that, right? How do we, facilitate the building out of those units. Uh, it's a lot. Uh, it's, it's, uh, I see it as, as almost this aspirational goal that, you know, we, we've been trying to reach some of the, some of the um, goals that the mayor put out uh, several years back. And obviously that, that has been challenging as well. And so when you think about 60,000 plus, uh, obviously it gives me heartburn and, and, and curious as to how we as a city are going to approach it. And so with that, Assuming you agree with that, right? Uh, those thoughts. What I'm curious about is, do you do you believe that it's going to require a different approach from the city, different methodologies to try to meet that? Um, and if so, uh, what comes to mind for you? Because, and just before you answer, what comes to mind for me is so a few things I wrote down is so for example, does the commercial requirement for mixed use affordable housing lessen? Do we lessen that in order to accommodate more housing? Do we build in currently zoned industrial areas, which I know is a, obviously a sensitive topic, um, or, or do we do we have more housing in business districts and such? And I think I'm not. I know there's a lot of housing items, and I think there was a memo from the mayor that touched on a few of those things. But I'm curious, just generally, if you have any idea or thoughts on what new methodology, what new strategies we can sort of implement going forward to help us reach this goal. Yeah, I mean, I think I think in general, we have a general plan that can accommodate this housing. It's just sort of tweaking the framework that we have, making it easier for affordable um, zoning sites for housing as opposed, you know, pro proactively, uh, particularly for affordable. And that's the work we are planning to do. Um, I, I think just, you know, I think the frankly, the big the big one ticket item that's going to move us towards uh, a success on achieving our arena allocation, frankly, is going to be North San Jose. Okay. So opening up that plan. What's that? Opening up that plan. Correct. So that's, if there's one big ticket item, that's it, right? I mean, we're planning for a lot of housing downtown too, but so that's a body of work that must be completed before our housing element goes to the state for certification. Um, that's absolutely mandatory. We have to do that. Um, because that's we have a you know capacity of twenty four thousand units up there right now, and that's that's a huge lift. Um, so we're also going to be looking at um, how we can further uh, facilitate housing, particularly affordable in our urban villages as well. Um, I know the opportunity housing is something that we've you know we've been directed to look at, um, and we'll be bringing some thoughts on that or a, a sort of a framework for the council to consider next year. But we're not sort of at this point we're not seeing that as we're not banking on that as something that has to be done to achieve our housing element at this time. So it's really working within the existing growth areas that we have, tweaking the framework that we have so that we can move that housing forward. So we'll be looking, you know, at, frankly, at, at everything. But the, the key part of this is actually, you have to actually identify actual properties in the housing element. It's not like, well, we have this urban village or we have this growth area. You're gonna have to show the state, what properties are you gonna plan for housing? And so that's that's where the rubber hits the road, and so we may take steps. Once we do that, we may we will likely we will need to take steps to rezone that property to ensure that housing is allowed on that. Um, depending on the site, it may not be it may be two years upon certification of a housing element, or we may need to do it prior to certification. Okay, yeah. all right. Well, thank you so much for all the work. I, I know it's. Uh... You know, some of this stuff is is a little confusing, uh, and I'm sure to, to to many of us, I suspect, especially to the public. And and so uh, I'll, I'll just leave with this, uh, leave off with this, is that I know there's uh, some state legislation. I mean, SB 35 comes to mind, for example, things that that the state's imposing on us uh, that uh, complicates things just a little bit more. And so I often wonder, and I, I think personally, I need to better understand the interaction between some of that and some of the work you're doing uh, uh, arena and such, because I, I feel like there's a lot of interaction with, with, within that work. And I know in district two, for example, we just, um, th there's a project that's gonna be moving forward uh, via SB 35. And, and the challenge that I have with it uh, is, is that they're not obligated to do a community uh, sort of outreach or, or a community meeting, 
that particular project, uh, the developer has agreed to it, and we're going to bring into the fold a lot of the community members to express their perspectives and such. But uh, but it just it just creates a situation where I think it it, it can be. Uh, <laughs> Uh, become very contentious very quickly with residents if things are getting done in their respective neighborhoods without any public process. Uh, and so, um, yeah, I, th I think it's going to be an interesting time moving forward. So thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, just a question, Michael, just to clarify, you know, we've had email exchanges offline and there's been a uh, concern about this whole issue about Mid Coyote and what AVAG originally proposed. At this point, um, you don't need any action from us to clearly communicate to AVAG that uh, Coyote Valley is off limits. That's correct. Yeah, they understand that. AVAG staff understands that, correct. Great. Thank you. All right. Any other questions? Okay, I can't remember. We've got a motion. I'll move approval. Thank you, Councilmember Mendes. Second. Second, Councilmember Davis. Let's vote. Dennis? Aye. Morales? Aye. Yep. Aye. Roscoe? Aye. Davis? Aye. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Arenas? Yes. Bully? Aye. Camus? Aye. Jones? Aye. Locardo? Thank you. Thanks. Uh, 8.2 is the approval of refinancing conditions required by HUD for Huff Avenue apartments. I don't believe there's a presentation, is there, Rachel? That is correct. We do not have a presentation, but we're available for any questions you may have. Okay. The refinancing on Huff Avenue apartments will accept any public comment on that specific item at this time. 8.2. I don't see any hands, so we'll come back to the council. I just note that uh, first, I'm, I'm really uh, impressed by one element. Actually, I think it's Craig Garden that has the reserve fund for rent burden. Uh, I really appreciate the work that was done between staff and, and the developer on that. I'm just wondering, is that a feature that we could incorporate in, in all of these future refinancings or is that purely a very context specific issue. Because obviously we know there's a lot of renters who are really rent burdened, even in these affordable projects and being able to um, help assist them through that financing seems really like a great idea. Yeah, well, thank you. Um, the, the rent burden issue, um, one of the items that we are bringing forward tonight as well is our underwriting guidelines. And what we've done in the, as a part of the underwriting guidelines is we have specified that rent burden is something that we are going to be considering when we look at refinances and re um, syndications. And so as developers come through with existing apartments, that's something that we're going to be looking at. And so in our, um, as a part of um, the underwriting guidelines that will be clear so that people know what to expect. It is difficult for us based on the current loan agreements that we have and all of the documents that are already put together for those developments um, because rent burden was not specifically addressed when they were originally underwritten we can't put in like new requirements at this point in time or we're limited in that way um, but when they come to us and they're looking for us to take some sort of action that's a really good time for us to have this discussion and I think Craig Gardens is a great example of a real collaboration between us and First Community Housing to try and find solutions for the seniors that are living there that really do need some assistance. Thank this you. is Jack, Jackie Morales Fran, the director of the housing department. You know, we have recently become very concerned about this whole issue of rent burden, um, especially because we saw that AMIs were going up so rapidly. And um, I believe one of the council members, um, uh, council member Esparza asked us to look more deeply into this question. So we are taking to committee before the end of this year, a whole report out on this question of rent burden in affordable housing, uh, because we feel like we, it's really important for us to be much more proactive in looking at the impacts. Yeah, I appreciate that. I know that's not an easy one because obviously it's a zero sum game about 
how deeply we subsidize and how many units we can actually build and, and refinance. So appreciate the, the work on that. I, I just want to also just point out that uh, Half Avenue's apartments, I, I know it was developed by the Housing Authority in Santa Clara County. I was an intern <laughs> 25 years ago working on the financing structure on this. I think I was working for Matt Stanley and Kathy Robbins at the time. So now I feel really old that it's coming back already for refinancing. Uh, all right, uh, any other questions or comments? We'll entertain motion approval. Uh, motion, motion Councilmember Menes, second Councilmember Davis. Let's vote. Menes? Aye. Morales? Aye. Yep. Aye. Roscoe? Aye. Davis? Aye. Esparza? Yes. Reynas? Reynas? Foley? Aye. Camus? Aye. Jones? Aye. Ricardo? Yes. Going back to Arenas? Yes. Thank you. All right, we'll move on to the aforementioned 8.3 Craig Art Garden Senior Apartments refinancing. Again, there's no presentation. Uh, we'll go to the public to see if there's any comment on this 8.3, which is the Craig Gardens uh, refinancing. Uh, Tessa Woodman, see? Okay, good. Yeah, thank you so much. Refinancing subordination of the existing city loan. Well, I, I think we have to really start looking at uh, universal basic income and how we're going to assist the community to make the transition off of fossil fuels because that's really, we need your support to do that. And we need universal basic income as we, trend, like I said, transition but out of our fossil fuel jobs. I know you're saying it's, it's about housing, but the issue with housing and the payments for housing and the problems we're having is that, you know, people are having to sacrifice to go to work and work in conditions that are very dangerous to them. And it's even happening in our own city hall that, that I'm talking to people who work for the city and they are stressed because they have to go into the office because of your capitalistic, you know, uh, ad attitudes about, you know, making money for the, for the community and not thinking about public health. This is where we have to make this transition in terms of the housing and what you're saying, you know, for refinancing or whatever it is in the specifics, the issue of, you know, what's going to happen when we, when we get away from the moratorium, there is going to be massive uh, homelessness that's going to hit our community. And, and, and as well as the climate refugees that are, you know, are homeless and, and things like that. But so we have a lot of problems coming our way and we're not planning for the crises that are in our future. And, and it is that we need that universal basic income so that people don't have to make that sacrifice of their health to, to have a job. And that's what the capitalists are doing in our community. And even city of San Jose, their, your workers are stressed where they have their children at home and yet you only allow them to work one day a week at home. Like that's so generous of you. And that the, that you say that, oh, by the um, water. Thank you, uh, Catherine Hedges. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor Licardo, Council, and uh, housing staff. Um, regarding this and the previous issue, I would like to thank housing staff for taking the rent burden into account and looking for ways to uh, help tenants uh, regarding the AMI linked rent increases. Um, that's something I've been noticing. I'm working on a um, a research project about that. And ultimately the solution would be to have section eight fully funded so that anyone who meets income qualifications can pay only 30% of their income for rent. But I don't know when that's coming even in the next administration. So I'd like to thank the housing department for doing what they can with what they have. And also I forgot, I've been forgetting to acknowledge that the land we're on isn't, you know, we're all settlers here. This is all unceded Ohlone land. Thank you very much. Thank you. The person with the phone number ending 5140. 
Yeah, I'd like to know when all these subsidies are going to end. Refinancing, I mean, it's unbelievable. You guys are spending money like drunken sailors. It's unbelievable. When is it going to end all the subsidies? And never, ever is a taxpayer thanked, ever. It's just more, more, more. So I want to know, I mean, using HUD, and I mean, all these acronyms, it's unbelievable. I mean, it would be cool if we had people like Tony Soprano who lived here. Maybe things would get built. I don't know. But uh, who you guys, you guys are corporate gangsters. That's, who, that's, that's what you are. Your mouthpieces for corporate gangsters should all be ashamed of yourselves. You never thank the taxpayer, and these subsidies are never going to end. And you're in an economy where there's zero revenue coming in. I want to ask the city council where all this money is going to come from for now and in the future to fund the pensions, to fund the subsidies. I'd really like to know. Nobody tells us. You guys just vote yes on everything. Hey, why don't you vote yes on giving me some money? I, I Something told me you guys would do it. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Tessa Woodman, oh, I believe you spoke already. Okay. Thank you. We'll come back then to the council. Was there a motion on this one already? I can't seem to remember. No, no okay. there's not. Councilman Jimenez with the motion. Second. And second, let's vote. Jimenez? Aye. Alice? Aye. Yep. Aye. Roscoe? Aye. Davis? Aye. Ms. Barza? Yes. Arenas? Foley? Aye. Camus? Aye. Jones? Aye. Licardo? Aye. Going back to Arenas? A marking absent. Okay, thank you. Uh, we'll go to 8.4, which is the housing, housing crisis work plan update. There's a presentation on this. Welcome. Is it uh, Jackie or Rachel? It's Jared Ferguson. Jared. Jared. Okay, welcome, Jared. Hey, good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Jared Ferguson, Housing Catalyst with the Office of Economic Development um, with Rachel Vanderveen, Deputy Director of the Housing Department and Michael Brio, Deputy Director, Planning, Building and Code Enforcement. So we're here today to update you on the housing crisis work plan. As a reminder, the work plan was adopted by the city council in 2018 to facilitate the city's goal of 25,000 new housing units by 2023 with 15,000 market rate units and 10,000 affordable units. We generally provide a biannual update um, to the community economic development committee on, on progress implementing our policy items and projects contained in the work plan. However, this is our first update in 2020. So at our last uh, housing crisis work plan update in late 2019, high construction costs were the major obstacle to the construction of, of new market rate housing. This continued into early 2020. Uh, with, with the onset of the pandemic, we've seen rents fall in San Jose since March uh, with and, uh, a uh, pretty dramatic increase in vacancy as well. Um, so this chart is showing both of those figures. Rent has declined uh, about 6% overall and vacancy is, is at about 7.8%. Uh, this has been especially dramatic in class A apartment buildings. Rents in those have declined uh, a little over 10% uh, with vacancy a little over 16%. Uh, so these are pretty challenging conditions right now for new projects to move forward. Um, you know, work from home and the pandemic has shifted people from cities to some extent. And, and it's, you know, not clear, you know, if that's temporary or more permanent. Um, however, uh, in our conversations with the uh, development community, there's still relative confidence in San Jose that, you know, some of these things will start to hopefully bounce back, um, you know, once the pandemic situation improves. Um, so it will be important that we continue to move any new applications through the planning entitlement process so that when these conditions do change, we know we have new units that are ready to go. 
um, obviously something this is something we'll be you know monitoring pretty pretty closely moving forward and then into our housing production all right so this is the chart that we use as a group to track our progress um, by different category towards meeting the goal so if you look at the left side you can see actions over time that we have passed as a city to increase capacity for housing in the general plan. So examples of this would include increasing heights, um, adding urban villages, actions like that, that actually increase housing capacity overall. The next columns actually walk through and show over time as, a, as like a point in time, it'll sh it shows the planning approvals, building improvements, building permits and occupant see permits that have been issued. And what we'd like to highlight for you in the presentation today is that the affordable housing pipeline um, is really an area where we're seeing growth. So if you look at the numbers for under affordable from 2019 to um, 2020, you're going to see the planning approvals go from 702 to 964, and you're also going to see the building permits go from 134 to 369. So we're really seeing growth in this area, and we wanted to highlight that today. Also, under the market rate um, highlights, the grad recently opened and was a major contributor to the occupancy increase that you can see in the most recent time um, for uh, market rate occupancy. Next slide. Okay, so uh, this next slide um, pulls pulls the data from the, the previous slide, uh, but more specifically looking at uh, units receiving building permits. Just wanted to highlight th this uh, metric since it generally tracks when new construction starts. Um, so uh, starting from the left, you have you know 2018, um, about 2,900 uh, units receiving building permits. Um, slight downward uh, trend in 20, 2019. Um, both of these years sort of tracking generally around um, our, our annual average uh, going back at least 10 years or so. Um, and then uh, the, at the, uh, on the right, you have um, 2020 uh, in the blue is um, Q uh, quarter one through quarter three. Um, and then the, the shaded line there kind of reflects if, if the fourth quarter kind of uh, averages the same as, as the first three where we'd be at uh, total. Um, so you can kind of see that this is reflecting, you know, what, what I kind of described in the, in the market conditions. Um, ADUs were the primary driver of, of new, market, new market rate housing units in, in quarter three getting building permits. Um, so this is something that we're going to keep tracking uh, very closely as well. And then this next slide, um, so this tracks overall progress um, uh, towards our 25,000 housing unit goal in the, fr from the housing crisis work plan. Uh, so th this is similar to the, the first chart that Rachel described, but this actually um, is a full accounting towards the 25,000 units. So if, if a unit moves uh, from planning approval to, to getting a, uh, a building permit and under construction, then we would remove it from one category. Um, so the, this kind of reflects the overall accounting towards our, towards our, our total goals. So I think just one thing to, to point out, I think the one thing that we'll be watching for on, on this slide is that um, you know, you see kind of the larger numbers at the top uh, with units getting planning approval as we continue to follow this slide, just making sure that those units continue to move downward and so that, you know, the numbers are, are tracking there um, and, and um, so that units are, are moving through and not kind of getting stuck in that, that first, first category. So generally, there's two primary paths for financing affordable housing. The first is 9% tax credits, which have always been highly competitive in the state of California. And the second is 4% tax credits, which are paired with tax exempt bonds. In the past, these bonds have been non-competitive and were available for developers who met the threshold criteria for their proposed developments. 
we wanted to share with all of you uh, a reality that over the last year, the demand for the tax exempt bonds has outstripped the supply and the amount of bonds available in the state of California. So now these bonds um, kind of overnight became competitive as well. The parameters that were set in place to determine how to decide which developments would be funded um, included a tiebreaker that took into consideration the overall cost of development. And this tiebreaker provided an advantage to proposed developments coming from Southern California over those coming from the Bay Area. One example for us in San Jose here is the West San Carlos project, which has now applied for um, bonds three times and has been turned down. And what happens when they are not able to secure an award is that it extends the time period for them to be able to break ground because they need to have their financing in place before they can actually pull a building permit. So over the last year, there was a statewide working group that was pulled together to develop new guidelines for future allocation of these bonds. And these new guidelines will be put in place for the coming year in 2021. We are encouraged that the new guidelines will provide a regional allocation, which will allow us to be competing instead just against um, Bay Area um, developments rather than putting North and South against each other. But we wanted to just make you all aware of this challenge and we're asking for your support and advocacy at the state level as we continue to monitor this challenge that is facing many of our affordable housing developers today. Next slide. So um, I think as many of you are aware, there's been a, a couple key state streamlining bills um, that were passed. The first is SB 35 that was passed in 2017. Um, so SB 35 requires at least 50% of the units to be affordable on properties with a zoning or a general plan designation that allows housing. So what this generally means is it's 100% affordable housing projects that are able to use SB 35. Um, and what it does is it removes requirements for CEQA analysis. It allows for ministerial approval um, and, and doesn't require um, it go through a community outreach or hearing process. So to date, we've had four SB 35 projects approved that, that uh, totaling 356 affordable units. The other bill, which was passed in 2018, is AB 2162, which is similar but it's for permanent supportive housing on properties currently zoned for housing. And this also removes the requirement for CEQA analysis and, and, and public hearings as well. Um, and so far three AB 2162 projects um, have been approved for a total of 306 affordable units. In addition, staff is currently reviewing six more projects that would amount to a total of 1,172 affordable units. So these bills really have made a difference. I know at, at, at times there's concern that there's not opportunities for engagement with the community um, because of ministerial approval, but they are really moving the needle on, on building and entitling affordable housing. Next slide. In this slide, we wanted to show you uh, the affordable housing pipeline and we're, we are excited to share that the pipeline has more than doubled over the past year. We believe that the changes in state law have created opportunities for streamlining and have really fueled the growth in our pipeline. This has been an important factor combined with the availability of additional funds for affordable housing between specific measures such as Measure A and Measure E that have been passed by our local communities. In order to utilize these laws, developers must, must identify sites for affordable housing that are consistent with our general plan. This new legislation is saving time and resources for our affordable housing developers and is guiding development into areas where the city has de designated housing development. Next slide. Since March 2020, um, when the pandemic 
came and really changed our lives. Um, our team has been working together to bring forward policies to provide a direct response to the COVID-19 pandemic in addition to our typical policy housing policy work. These policy efforts include bringing forward the eviction moratorium, the moratorium on rent increases, and providing over $25 million in rental assistance. Next slide, please. Significant accomplishments that we wanted to highlight in this report to you today include the establishment of a commercial linkage fee in September 2020, the launch of a new website over the summer, successful neg negotiations with Caltrans for a bridge housing site and an emergency interim housing site over the course of the last year, and the adoption of a citywide anti-displacement strategy in the fall. Next slide. So um, there are a number, so we have uh, a number of items um, in our general plan for your review that also happen to be in our housing crisis work program. One of them is to allow housing and neighborhood business districts. And this is something that staff and the task force are recommending to move forward with this. Um, so that the business districts where housing would be allowed to be integrated with commercial development are, uh, it, are, are 13th Street, Japantown, the Taylor Street portion, Willow Glen, and Willow Street or Calle Willow. Um, so we will be bringing that recommendation to the council in the spring of, of next year. Um, the other thing that council or that's on our work program as well as in our four-year re review scope is exploring changes to commercial requirements. So um, if you remember, we have uh, a, a policy that's been called or is commonly called the one and a half acre rule that required, um, a, that allows affordable housing to convert essentially commercial property if that property is underutilized or vacant. And um, it also required replacement or, or provision of some amount of commercial uh, development in a mixed use project. And so staff's recommendation on that, as well as the task force, is to remove that requirement that affordable housing have to provide commercial um, uh, space within their development. Um, this recommendation, actually, there, there's a, a, a larger body of work uh, uh, as part of this one and a half acre rule that's, that, that we are working on to further define what underutilized is. And we'll be bringing um, all of the recommended changes to this policy to council in February of next year. So um, if you remember, uh, as part of our work of, of identifying residential cost of, of development, um, we have on two occasions in the past had uh, a consultants really look at what are the current real, what is the current real estate market? What are the factors that are driving development costs and understanding what the market is and what, what is the feasibility of development in various geographies in San Jose. So the last report um, that was done was in November of 2019. Staff are currently in the process of, of issuing an RFP to select a consultant to provide regular updates. Um, we're planning to do these updates on an annual basis and with the next planned cost of development update for council in 2021. The other thing is, uh, is one of the other work items uh, that we've been undertaking is, is, is developing a, a site acquisition database and mapping tool that would help housing developers, particularly affordable housing developers to find sites that are consistent with our general plan policy framework. Um, this mapping tool was launched, uh, San Jose Housing Site Explorer in August, 2020. And we're continuing to refine and improve that tool. Next slide. So uh, moving new, moving forward new units in North San Jose has been a major policy goal in the housing crisis work plan um, and the focus of a lot of our ongoing work. Um, Previously, staff proposed abandoning the, the previous strategy of modifying the phasing within the existing North San Jose development policy. Staff has continued down this path th through 2020 and is now also recommending that the city take the required steps to retire the area development policy. Uh, the first step in that process that is going on now is to continue work to, to continue the work with Santa Clara to outline issues and concerns 
and move forward with amendments to the settlement agreement through mediation as a second step um, to transition the area of development policy by amending the engineer's report to align the money collected um, along with built transportation projects with the development that's completed uh, consistent with CEQA and identify a strategy for any remaining capital projects that the city wants to pursue. We'll, we'll also need to amend the general plan and zoning code to facilitate future development. Uh, this is underway now and is estimated to take approximately six to 12 months. Um, and then a third step uh, to allow uh, commercial and residential projects to move forward with their own CEQA clearance under the development capacity within the existing general plan. Uh, and then as the step four, consider opportunities to do additional planning work that could include a, a program level VMT approach on a longer term basis. This isn't started yet and we would anticipate that it would take 12 to 36 months to fully explore this, this option. Um, and then a, another piece of our work plan um, uh, has been the, the uh, downtown residential high rise program. Um, on August 25th, uh, the council approved setting the IHO and Luffy to $0 for high rise development in the downtown core. Uh, as a reminder, um, to obtain that $0 fee, uh, a project must obtain uh, its building permit by June 30, 2023, and then obtain a certificate of occupancy by June 30, 2025. And then fees scale scale back up incrementally for projects after June 2023 until June 2025. Uh, council directed staff to explore options to extend the, the timeline and also to look at applying uh, to high rises outside of, of the downtown core. So uh, we're proposing uh, to combine the effort of um, uh, to combine this work with our update to the report on the, the cost of residential development. Um, we think it, it aligns well um, in terms of, of, of um, uh, very similar in terms of the report that's needed. Um, and it allows us to go through the, the normal selection uh, process for a consultant. Um, and it, it's already budgeted for um, our update to the cost of development. Um, and then uh, we would work to ensure that the report would analyze the feasibility of high rise construction in a variety of sub markets so that the council could make the decision at, at that time, you know, based on feasibility, whether or not they wanted to apply it um, to other other geographic areas uh, based on that report. Um, and then, as Michael mentioned, we intend to, con you know, continue to update that, that on an annual basis. And so um, decisions, you know, could be made around that report more regularly. Um, and, and so we think it makes sense to, com to combine those two and um, still allows us to do it in uh, uh, ample time um, to uh, extend that program if needed prior to the expiration of, of what's currently approved. Um, so. All right. And right, and before we move into questions, we just wanted to also acknowledge uh, the mayor's memo on this on this item for the housing crisis work plan. Um, in in his memo, there are there were two two items that we um, agree with. We had the um, there was a reference to working with Caltrans on looking at additional sites and also pri um, prioritizing ADUs. And those are, um, we feel comfortable and consistent with all of our work plans for those items. Regarding the reimagine underutilized business corridors, we do want to think carefully about this recommendation. Um, the general plan provides significant opportunity for housing and, um, on current or formal commercial property that there are sites that would be included in our urban villages, either those that are planned or those that are unplanned that are still coming. There are additional growth areas that provide those opportunities. And we have the one and a half acre rule that also provides an opportunity for affordable housing to go in sites such as those. And as we stated today, one of the obstacles that we are really facing right now is um, is the availability of financing. And we want to continue to put our efforts in, in trying to sort out how we can get the resources that it takes to actually build out even all of the housing that 
is um, has come down to planning for a preliminary application already. Um, we have several sites that we're excited about and we want to support and we want to bring the resources to those efforts. And, um, and then lastly, for the priority to have 20% uh, of all the develop, new housing development in North San Jose be 20% affordable, we definitely see this as a, a goal, a stretch goal for this area. This is something that we do wanna see. We just wanna state that it may just be a challenge just because of some of the tools that are limited right now that we have. So for example, our inclusionary housing ordinance is limited to a 15% requirement on site. So if someone, if a developer did wanna build affordable housing in the development, they would be limited to 15% and it's difficult based on our legal parameters to actually increase that requirement. Also, we always have, we also, as another legal requirement, we have the option for developers to pay an in-lieu fee. And when they do that, it's just, it's harder to meet those goals. But if we do want to meet those goals, we just wanna add that we need to seek sites in North San Jose for affordable housing. Recently, we did this with the purchase of the Vista Montana site. We're excited about that opportunity. We feel that there's a great capacity for affordable housing on that site. And we want your support and just other, and to be thinking deeply about how, what could it take for us to meet that goal. And we really think that being aggressive with finding sites in North San Jose is definitely gonna be part of that strategy. And with that, we're available for any questions that you might have. Great, thank you, Rachel. Thank you, uh, Jared, and thank you, Michael. Uh, let's go to the public now, uh, and then we'll come back to council. Uh, we're taking public comment on 8.4 housing crisis work plan update. Uh, we'll start with Blair Beekman. Hi, thank you. Uh, I hope a lot of people want to be speaking to the uh, the next item today. I, I missed all the, there was a lot of zoning talk around Jake Tonkel, and everyone was all up in arms. And it would be nice if that process was brought to, uh, you know, the city council process here. I would, I would like to hear the back and forth debate and public comment uh, about, about the issues of, of rezoning. And um, I think ideas are possible. And, you know, I've, I've stated here enough, I'm really learning, you know, the, what is important to myself is, is is very low income, extremely low income and mixed income housing ideas that I, I think mixed income housing ideas, especially, you know, as we are in, entering a time of the era of defund reform and, and equity, you know, I, I think that, uh, you know, these housing issues are really important. And the ideas of mixed income housing, I think can just bridge a lot of your zoning questions you're having and debates that are that are have that are taking place. I think it can do really interesting work. It is asking people from thirty and forty thousand dollar incomes how can they live with people in eighty to ninety thousand dollar incomes. I think that's kind of considered taboo at this point. I think learning to bring those different groups together. Uh, I think that can do a really, really interesting thing for our future. And it's a, a bit experimental still, but I, I think that's the kind of thinking we have to have in rezoning that can really keep the, the area small, the housing small and uh, yet really functional and uh, purposeful. And uh, I, I really suggest looking into it and how we can broaden those ideas. Thanks. Thank you. I'm Matthew Reed. Yes, Matthew Reed from Silicon Valley at Home, uh, Mayor and Council, I appreciate this opportunity to share our thoughts. Um, housing crisis work plan updates are always a challenge because it's a tremendous amount of work that staff is doing and we, we get snippets and updates and I appreciated the, the uh, presentation today. It helped frame some of the uh, material that was in the memo. Um, but because it is the opportunity to talk about some of the policy items, we thought it was important to weigh in and we had a letter that was shared um, earlier. I'd like to say first that we, we really appreciate the mayor's memo of uh, recommending the recommitment to North San Jose and the affordable piece there and, and, and really continuing to look for 
um, underutilized opportunities for housing. We know it's not simple, but it was an important step and an important statement. Um, I want to touch on a couple of other points. The cost of development study. We really believe that originally this was intended to be a little broader um, than a study of the fee stacks and the impact they have on development decisions. And, and we would urge returning to the original housing crisis work plan direction. Um, the commercial requirements and affordable housing, this was an item that was intended to look citywide um, and the task force picked this up um, and uh, has made some strong recommendations. I appreciate uh, Mr. Brio acknowledging that, but I think there's, there's a broader discussion to have and we'll have that when the task force recommendations come back to council. And finally, I want to acknowledge that there, there is real movement on the 1.5 acre rule. There's a, a, a stakeholder meeting that's been scheduled and we're, we're looking forward to that work. So thank you very much. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, Tessa? Thank you. Well, I was very disappointed to hear Mayor Licardo say that the, the housing issue, what the regional housing was a four letter word. I think that speaks volumes for you know the values of our city and we need to really change that. And that's even this issue of, of him recommending, Mayor Licardo recommending North San Jose. Let's remember what happened in North San Jose, that our council, you know, our business friendly council went ahead and decided that they needed an off ramp that dumped into a, a school ground, you know, leaving our children with health and and life and safety issues. You know, that's how we're building North San Jose as a, as a um, you know, car-based infrastructure, which is wrong, you know. So then to say that the housing should be there is wrong. And here I am in my neighborhood on Stockton Avenue, which is all the place where we should be leaving. And you have zoned the commercial properties on the west side of Stockton to not have any housing. You can't have any housing there. Mm -hmm. Just like we couldn't have any housing on Lincoln Avenue at Kirtner, couldn't have any housing. And, and, and Willow Glen, you know, these are, these are neighborhoods that are resource rich and walkable neighborhoods. And you're saying that we have to ha have commercial buildings there with no option of having um, housing. There's none when, you, when they're zoned for commercial. A lot of that, that's what commercial neighborhood, no housing opportunity. And then the 615 Stockton Avenue uh, owner, Alan Wynn, he applied for affordable housing and, they, and, and he had this big project and they said no because they said it's across from uh, uh, um, across the street on the east side of Stockton is is heavy industry. So yeah, we have a World Coach Tours, the bus depot, a diesel bus depot. And, and this is what's causing health problems in our neighborhood, deaths. I mean, we're, a, we're a, um, a, an area of high impact from diesel emissions. And this is what's causing death and, and disability in our community. And you know, you, yeah, you're not gonna allow it affordable housing, but- Thank you. Um... Number ending 5140. Yeah, I, I don't believe that uh, you should be able to tear down a house and then build a six unit or four unit complex. Uh, the people who live in these neighborhoods, District, well, I call, like to call it Detroit 9 and District 6, the, the reps there voted against it. The one good thing they voted no on and I want to thank them for that because you're going to see this this whole city just would tear down housing and putting in some subsidized four or six unit uh, uh, complex. It's going to be horrible. And wh why should I have to live next to people who don't have the money to live in my neighborhood? Like they're going to have to find someplace else. I mean, if you want to really build, I told you guys, I would love to see favelas on the hillside. That would be perfect subsidized Fidelas and the entryway could be little Portugal. It would be just like a, it would be like Brazil. You know, that would be, that's what you guys want in the end. Anyway, you want a third world country. That's what you want. You, you want to completely destroy what people have built up here over, over the course of, of many years to destroy these homes, to destroy the neighborhoods, to destroy the infrastructure. Where are you going to, I mean, where are you going to fit all these people? You don't have enough utilities or water to support anything. You want to build all these villages, build, 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 build. Where's the money coming from? Nobody on the city council can tell me. 
Nobody. You guys just keep you, you guys just stay really silent after my call. You don't say anything because you don't have the answers. I'd like somebody to answer. I like I like uh, I like my representatives to answer me where all this money is going to come from for everything else. Thank God she voted against not building more housing here, tearing down homes or ruining the Rose Garden neighborhood. Could you imagine that? We we're supposed to build low income housing in the Rose Garden. Who who thinks? JT, if you want to solve the housing crisis, it's not with projects that are for the dozen. So, you guys should try to find find a project that can house over a thousand people. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Good afternoon. This is Alex Shore, Executive Director of Catalyze SV. Want to thank staff for continuing to work on these issues, to the mayor and council for continuing to receive these updates so the city's attention can continue to be focused on these things. Fortunately, in the projects that Catalyze SV sees, we are seeing more affordable housing projects anecdotally in San Jose. We're seeing more of those developers being willing to thanks to the city's values and thanks to perhaps our urging more of those developers building the affordable housing units on site so that we can get the housing built sooner and we're very very grateful for opportunities to see more housing even when it's streamlined uh, although we do continue to welcome community engagement as those projects get built in order to build long-term support for affordable housing want to join SV at home in saying that you know the cost of development study should be broader. Uh, I think sometimes we think about what the cost of development could be. Maybe we can also think about what the cost of, of not doing development would be and the downsides of that for our community as income inequality, according to Richard Florida, the urban professor finds is the highest of San Jose. Uh, is the highest in San Jose of any metropolitan city in the entire U.S. of a major metropolitan city. So we definitely want to continue to get the affordable housing units in the pipeline, and we thank City for continuing to keep this priority very much in mind as part of the work plan. Thank you, Alex. Uh, Catherine? Uh, good afternoon, and I agree with everything Alex just said. And also, I'd like to address the comments of the person who calls in with his phone number. Um, there was a lot of racist rhetoric in the last election about how allowing um, opportunity zoning with, um, say, fourplexes on a lot of a former family house. This is not going to be low-income housing. It's simply the economics don't work out to build low-income housing. And low-income housing is a dog whistle for, for basically for white communities who don't want non-white people moving into their neighborhood. And we should not be giving in to racists and we should not be holding San Jose back and letting the housing crisis continue just because racists are afraid that, you know, people like Kamala Harris might move in in their neighborhood. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's uh, against public comment. Uh, let's go to council and council member Esparza. Thank you. Um, I just had a couple of things that I wanted to point out. Um, one is I wanted to thank um, the Housing and Community Development Commission uh, for voting uh, to recommend that the city council direct staff to identify the criteria that would be allowed, that would be used to prioritize mobile home parks for general plan redesignation uh, to mobile home park. Uh, my staff has, um, talked with the city staff and we understand that fully funding and resourcing this effort um, can take some time and it will take some time but it's imperative that we get started as a city in identifying further parks 
that will most benefit from this additional level of protection. Um, and then uh, second, I wanted to bring up that I think it's crucial to tie the work of this work plan to the work on our updated affordable housing site housing siting policy um, that we will be hearing about later today. I think siting considerations need to be integrated into our affordable housing policies. So I just want to make sure that this work aligns with that effort. That's all, thank you. Thank you. Um, just wanted to follow up with some questions. Uh, Rachel, appreciate the points you made. Uh, and as, uh, and again, with apologies, because I know my memorandum was submitted lately today. Uh, so I appreciate not everyone's had an opportunity to vet it carefully. Um, but just going back to um, the, the issues you identify, it sounds like uh, Housing Department is fine with coming back to council with some description of the work that you've done with Caltrans and look at sites. And I appreciate you doing that because I think we all have probably some questions about what other opportunities there might be out there of Caltrans sites and, and whether, you know, what criteria we've been using. Um, with regard to the, um, the 20 percent allocation, this is paragraph three, uh, 20 percent of all housing built in North San Jose since the commencement of phase one be affordable. Um, I understand with the expiration of the area development plan, we're not going to have an enforcement mechanism. So I know the term insurance compliance is probably a little strong there. Um, but I, I guess what I had assumed was that we weren't going to do this simply with the 15% inclusionary. Rather, what we were going to be able to achieve that goal with would be a fair number of 100% affordable developments, along with whatever we're able to do with inclusionary. And so I guess the question is, if, if we don't have an explicit hook, um, is there at least a mechanism for staff to be able to steer or nudge <laughs> to ensure mm -hmm. we could get uh, affordable housing that gets us into that 20% realm and that goal? Yes, I can jump in and Jack, Jackie can add as well. Um, this is definitely something that we've been thinking about when there are specific geographic areas where we'd really like to see more affordable housing. Um, I think we really see North San Jose as an opportunity area within our city with the access to transit and jobs and um, real, you know, just real opportunity in that part of our city. And so it is a place we want to see affordable housing development. And so, um, so one of the things that we have been considering and just thinking about is if, um, well, first of all, we could, we could, we have already prioritized our funding in that area, right? So if, if, if developers want to receive funding from, from um, us, then that's an area where they could. Um, also, we've just been thinking too, if there's a way for us to connect revenue that's generated in that area, either through commercial or uh, market rate development, and see if we can try and target those funds back into that area as well. Um, so that's something that we've been thinking about. We have not established a policy to do that, mm -hmm. but, um, but I think we want, to, we want to explore the different tools we have to create the resources in the areas where we'd like to see that type of development. Okay. Well, then is staff's more comfortable with, you know, returning in future months as you're working through that, figure out what combination of policies might get us there? I'm, you know, I'm happy to support a supplanting, you know, ensure compliance, but I, I think we all are trying to get to the same goal. Yeah, this is Jackie from the housing department. I would agree, Mayor, with your, just your comment that we should come back because what, what will make it work is we need to have a, a plan, right? So we need to have policies and money and incentives that Rachel just discussed that you know, are in writing that we all agree to and that we can implement. And we need the council's support to take some of those actions. Right, okay, uh, fair enough then. And, and then on paragraph two, I understand there are, um, as Rachel described, other policies certainly that we can point to um, for development of housing on commercial sites, including 
strip malls, I guess what I was anticipating, I think it's probably many of us are, is that there's gonna be a lot of landlords out there um, that haven't received much rent in a while and they're gonna be looking for real opportunities to redevelop. And um, so I just wanna make sure that we uh, had our eyes on that opportunity. Um, at this point, and forgive me, I have not consulted the general plan text in a while on this. Is it the case that a typical general plan land use designation for a strip mall, whatever commercial designation that is, would allow mixed use, uh, that is construction of housing along with the redevelopment of that commercial? It really, this is Michael, it really depends on the area. So I would say the general rule is, is no, the general plan, if it's commercial, it needs to be just commercial. Um, however, there are exceptions to that rule in, the, in urban villages where we have the policy where affordable housing could be built in a mixed use format. I know there's a lot of discussion about whether it should be mixed use or just or 100% of housing. Um, and then we have the one and a half acre rule, which allows underutilized commercial properties to convert to affordable. And what we in the task force are proposing is it would just could be all 100% affordable. Right. That, that's a policy framework to convert sort of those older un, underutilized strip malls. And we'll be bringing that complete framework to council um, next, I think it's, we're looking at February. Okay. Well, recognizing that work's being done, what I would just ask if, if someone is willing to make the motion, I'll withdraw paragraph two uh, to enable staff to bring that work to us. And so we can look at that option that you've already outlined. Uh, and we can think further about whether or not there's more that's required. Um, and um, yeah, I would support obviously moving forward with paragraphs one, three, and four with some modification of paragraph three that would allow staff to do additional work to consider how exactly we can um, promote uh, a 20% affordability requirement or 20% uh, of the housing that would get built would be affordable. So I just throw that out uh, and as a request to my colleagues. Um, with regard to land banking, I know that we're doing some work on, you know, looking at CDCs and land trusts. Rachel, could you give us a sense of sort of where that work is at this point or is, is that pretty early? Yeah, so our, our team has explored um, different options. We've been doing research on, um, kind of the different mechanisms that are available. Um, I would just say at this point, um, we're still in the research phase and just due to limited staffing capacity, we haven't been able to um, move too, too much further down that road, but it is something that we're interested in exploring. Okay, thank you. All right, are there other questions? Motion. I'll, I'll take a shot at uh, making the motion. Uh, Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, so I'd like to make a motion to accept uh, staff's recommendation and include the mayor's memo uh, withdrawing um, item number two, modifying item number three to request that staff uh, come back with an analysis. And hopefully I didn't miss anything. And that's it. Second. Second. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Second from uh, Councilmember Foley. All right. Uh, any other comments? All right, let's vote. Yes, I don't know if you said my name. Yes, yes, yes got it. Carl is? Aye. Yep. Aye. Costco? Aye. Davis? Aye. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Camus? Aye. Jones? Aye. Ricardo? Aye. I also want to announce that um, right after I called the vote, Arenas texted me yes as she had lost internet connection. Um, so the previous item 8.3 was 11 zero. Oh, thank you for reminding me. Thank you, Tony. Okay, uh, we'll go on then. Um, See, we, we have been typically uh, taking some late dinners, but uh, why don't we go ahead with the next item, which is 8.5 to propose fiscal year 2021 measure E real property transfer tax lending plan. I know that's gonna be heard concurrently. 
with 8.6, which is the fiscal year 2021 and 2022, 23 affordable housing investment plan. Um, and why don't we go through the presentation and um, take a look at where we're at in timing and maybe take a break at that time. Great. Uh Good evening, Mayor and City Council. Again, I am Jackie morales Ferrand. I am the Director of Housing, and I'm joined this evening by Rachel Vanderveen, who, as you know, is our Deputy Director. As you said, just said, we're going to be hearing items 8.5 and 8.6 together. Measure E was passed by the voters in March 2020, and this is the first spending plan being brought to the City Council for consideration. The Affordable Housing Investment Plan outlines the funding available for the development of new affordable housing from now through fiscal year 2022-23. 20, uh, consistent with the Mayor and the City Council's goal to build 10,000 units within a five-year period. Slide. Um, the objectives today are to approve both the Measure E Spending Plan and the Affordable Housing Investment Plan. We are not recommending any modifications to the policies that guide our investments. However, the plan requires that if we receive a new funding source that we update the plan to clearly indicate how those funds will be used and the impact of those funds on our overall production of affordable housing units. Next slide. Measure E revenue is our new funding source. The budget office anticipates we will receive $30 million. In December 2019, the City Council approved a spending allocation plan. Based on the Council approved plan, 45% of the funding is, is to be directed for the construction of extremely low income um, and 35% is, is allocated for low income rental housing. So both of those close to 80% um, of our funding is for rental housing development. 10% is to be used for moderate income housing, which can be rental and or home ownership. And finally, 10% is being used for homeless prevention and rental assistance. The housing investment plan only includes the ELI low income and moderate income housing dollars, since all of these investments result in the production of affordable housing. Rachel will walk you through the details of the spending plan and the affordable housing investment plan. Are you Rachel, your, Rachel? your device might be off right now. We're not able to hear you, Rachel. Sorry. Let me try that again. All right. So the Measure E spending plan demonstrates the specific programs that will be funded consistent with the categories established by the City Council. So under the category for extremely low income households, the plan includes $12 million dollars that will be added to our investment program for creating new affordable housing for extremely low income households. Under the low income category, we have $4.9 million for the acquisition new development of affordable housing. And we've actually also set aside $5 million for the acquisition and rehab of existing buildings for low income households. This is um, consistent with prior direction from the City Council, where we were asked to identify $10 million to prioritize for acquisition rehab activities, and is also consistent with uh, the recent passage of our anti-displacement um, strategy, which includes identifying funding to acquire buildings in order to um, place affordability restrictions on them and ensure that they remain affordable in the long term. The next category is for moderate income households and we are recommending consistent with the mayor's budget message a $2.8 million, which will basically be reserved at this time and will be added to an additional allocation next year to put together for a um, ADU loan program. And in the homeless prevention and rental assistance category, we are recommending $2.7 million of new funding for homeless prevention and an additional 55,000 for the student housing program in this year 
and 60,000 for the coming year. The affordable housing investment plan includes policies that the city council has passed over time as we've brought forward investment plans over the last several of years to demonstrate different priority areas for city funding. So the priorities that have been identified include alignment with Measure A. When Measure A was passed, there was a strong alignment between the county, the city, and the housing authority to work together to find solutions to create permanent supportive housing in San Jose. And we established a priority for um, Measure A projects that are coming forward within our city. Most recently, when the investment plan was brought forward to the city council, there was a commitment from our city council to spend 45% of all funds on funding extremely low income housing. Additionally, as I just mentioned, there was $10 million that was set aside for the for acquisition rehab. And we also included a place-based strategy where we identified specific growth areas where we would like to see our funding. Um, and we, and as projects come forward, until we have our affordable housing siting policy put in place, we are continuing to use our place-based strategy to incentivize development in areas such as North San Jose and the Deer Don Station area. A couple of years ago, we have also made the priority to limit our funding to $125,000 per unit. What this does is allows us to fund as many units as possible we understand that the cost of development is very high. However, we have limited resources and really we want to have a broad impact. We also have prioritized developments that have cost saving construction techniques and those that have applied for and secured affordable housing sustainable communities funding, which brings not only funding for the affordable housing, but also for um, investments in infrastructure around the development that also help our city. In the investment plan that we have for your consideration today, this plan brings forward over $220 million in affordable housing funds over the next um, couple of years. This includes funding from the low and moderate income housing fund, this is um, revenue from the affordable housing impact fee, the inclusionary housing ordinance, um, home funds, which are federal dollars for new development, and our most recent addition of Measure E funds. The city has identified funding for 3,560 affordable apartments over this period of time using all of the funds that we have available and assuming that we would be awarding $125,000 per unit. What we also find interesting is that as we take a look at our um, pipeline, there are an additional 3,874 units that are coming forward that are funded with other sources. And this is an increase four and a half times since what we saw in 2017 of of um, pipeline projects that are being funded by other sources. The way that developer, affordable housing developers are making this happen um, is number one, there are developments that are not seeking any public funding but are still able to move forward. Second, there are, fun, there are projects that are utilizing Measure A funds but are not requiring um, city funds. And then finally, our inclusionary ordinance is, um, I would just say that the recent changes that we've been talking about um, over the past year have really started new conversations with a lot of our market rate developers who are interested in finding ways to build affordable housing, either incorporated into their development or also clustered on sites um, that they're bringing forward. So that concludes our presentation and we are available for any questions that you have. Thank you, Rachel.
Okay, we're now at the five o'clock hour. Um, unless there's any objection, I'd like to take the break at this time. Um, so why don't we take a break uh, until six o'clock and then we'll begin our evening session at the normal six o'clock hour. Uh, thank you.